Okay, so now please uh, uh, stop sharing and give Shinji a possibility to share screen. Yes. Shinji. Yeah, sure, sure. I, all right. Oh, please share, uh, yeah, okay, share yeah. screen. Yes. Okay. Can you see it? Not yet. Uh -huh, yeah, okay. it's okay. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, so uh -huh. we can so, see. Okay, so let's begin the our the second day of our session. So the, the first talk is by Professor Shinji Sujikawa, probing elastic interactions between dark energy and dark matter. Please. Okay. okay. Thanks for interaction and thanks for the invitation to the big Okay, so today I talk on some kind of interacting more with dark energy probing elastic interaction between dark energy and dark matter. So this is a collaboration with some Spanish people and also some Italian people in University of Salamanca in Spain. Right. So the first is introduction. So the standard cosmic model is under CDM and uh, I mean origin of the dark energy is cosmos constant and W is minus one is lambda and, and the other is CDM is called dark matter. And so this is called under CDM but it suffers some tension, okay, well-known tension, H naught and sigma tension. So in, in this standard Ram CDM model, both H naught and sigma eight, a constraint from, from the Frank CMB are larger than those constraint from knowledge measurement. So this is the kind of figure. So if you have a look at the left, left figures, so the constraint from CMB is something around 60, 67, but in that kind of, Low rate shift measurement, they typically predict the value like 73. So there are some kind of tension, which is even like higher than whole sigma now. And there is also sigma tension, which is not so serious compared to H naught, but there are still there at, at, at least some two sigma level tension. So, so if you do the analysis with Frank data, you have the value of sigma H, like 0 0.81. But uh, if you add some kind of cross link data, you, know, you typically get some lower value. So so this is a like senior hotel that's clustering data. Well, we, by adding those data, you have some constraint of sigma eight, which is actually lower than like 0 0.8. Right, so I want to address uh, some these kind of tensions okay, by constructing some concrete model of dark energy and also dark matter. And so I, I, want, I want to focus on some interacting model of dark, dark, dark matter and dark energy. And actually there are many kind of phenomenological model actually dark matter and dark energy by modifying the background equation only. Okay. But in that case, I mean, there is some ambiguity of the perturbation equation motion. So, but with that explicit action, so all the background and perturbation equation uh, follow ambiguously, unambiguously from the single action. So I want to construct some explicit model with some explicit Lagrangian. And then want to solve this kind of tension. Front. Left. It's fine. Okay. So, so among the so there are kind of several possible interaction between CDM dark energy, and we are interested in the elastic scattering. So the reason is that this elastic scattering mediates the momentum transfer that can suppress the CDM growth rate. And so this kind of momentum transfer can be weighed by the scalar product, and this is a kind of scalar quantity. Okay, which can appear in the action. And so this is a product of CDM and so dark energy whole velocities. Okay. And I make some kind of scalar product from the whole velocity of CDM dark energy. And so this actual quantity in a fluid dynamics, it's re related to the entrainment. Okay. Entrainment is a some product of Z with respect to the number density of CDM and actual dark energy. Okay. But uh, if you consider this kind of entrainment itself, so it also mediates some energy transfer in addition to tra momentum transfer. So I want to actually uh, isolate the effect of the momentum transfer. So then because of this, I consider some Z dependence explicitly. Okay. And at the level of the interacting Lagrangian, you can consider a general function of this kind of coupling. So, I mean, the interacting Lagrangian where a is a function of f with respect to z. So, so let's consider some explicit action. 
So I want to make the analysis really make it simple. So I consider Einstein gravity. So that can be described by Ritz scala. And the second term, second integral is known as like shoot soaking action. So this can describe the action of the pike fluid. So I consider two pike fluid, the one is CDM and the other is dark energy. And so this low I is a, so I actually means like C and D. So C is CDM and D is actually dark energy. And this low I depend on number density NI of the CDM and dark energy respectively. And here there's like some current and GIV is a kind of current associated with the total number of each fluid. So, so this is actually conserved. So in the freedom of background, it corresponds to the total number of the actual particle. So, okay, and final one is the interaction between CDM and actual dark energy. And this is actually the term, interacting term I mentioned already. So if you vary the action with respect to the Lagrangian multiplier L here, okay, then it leads to the conservation equation. So there is a current conservation, as I said. And so if you rewrite this current conservation, you get this continuity equation. And P is defined like NY rho I comma NI minus rho I. So this is the pressure of the fluid. Right. So if you consider the flat freedom and background, so so situation is really kind of simple. So let's consider this nine element with a scale factor A. And then, so each fluid in the left frame has a four velocity with temporal component one and the other spatial component zero. So now I'm considering isotropic and homogeneous background. So I can consider this four velocity for the CDM and dark energy. And the current conservation can be translated to the total number of conservation. So NI is a total number of CDM dark energy respectively. And in terms of the number density, so it's just proportional to eight minus three. So total NI is like small NI multiplied by eight cubed. And the continuity equation can be explicitly in this way. So this is a standard one. So for both dark energy and dark matter, it satisfies, they satisfy this conservation equation, continuity equation. And zero zero and I component Einstein equation is also very simple. So we have just modification which come from F here and the other is really the standard one. So we have some density rho i and pressure pi, but we have some additional time which come from the interaction. But this is just actually constant because Z is, is actually minus one on this background. So F actually works as a cosmology constant. So we can absorb this cosmology constant into the dismission of rho d and pd. Okay. So I define like rho d hat and pd hat in this way. And then, so you see that the background is so oblivious to the interaction and like the case of energy exchange. So this is purely momentum transfer. So you don't explicitly see some kind of momentum uh, energy transfer. So in the presence of energy transfer, you have some additional term on the right hand side of continuity equation, but I'm concerned just the momentum transfer. So there is no kind of energy exchange okay, in, which appears in the continuity equation, right? So the background is just very simple, but the uh, modification appears at the level of perturbation. So let's consider some perturbable line element in the neutron gauge okay, with two gravitational potential C and phi. And then, so now, so I'm considering the shoot soaking action of the product for it, and it contains a current. And current has perturbation, and the temporal component of current can be decomposed like Ni background value plus perturbation delta Gi. And this delta Gi is related to the density perturbation in this way. So yes. And instead of delta Gi, it's more convenient to use this density perturbation itself. So in the, far, in the following, I use delta rho i. So at the linear order, delta rho i is related to the number density, a product of number density, like delta rho i is rho i comma ni multiplied delta ni. Right. And also from the spatial component of the current, so I have the perturbation like delta Gi, and that is related to the velocity potential of the fluid. So Vi is related to delta Gi in this way. So instead of delta Gi, okay, I use Vi in the following. Okay. So now I have two perturbations which come from matter sector, delta rho i and Vi. So I also introduced the fluid equation state, Wi is Pi over rho i, 
and also adiabatic sounds be like CI square, which is given by PI dot over Y dot. Right. And then, so, so I have explicit action, so I can derive the perturbation equation motion, okay, with, a, with, with an ambiguous way. And so this is a continuous equation, and this is really the same as standard. So that it just means that the coupling F does not affect continuous equation motion. So you don't see any modification which come from F, okay, okay, for this interaction. But if you have a look at, look at Euler equation, you have some modification. So this is a equation of the CDM velocity potential and dark energy velocity potential. And actually it mediates the momentum transfer, which is characterized by the last term, okay, which contain F comma Z. Okay, and you can see that there is some difference between velocity potential of CDM and dark energy. You can see it, so yes. So some, some difference between, okay, CDM and dark energy velocities okay, can affect the oil equation. So, and also we have Einstein equation, so I can derive the equation motion for the gravitational potential. And in this class of model, so there is no analytic stress. So it satisfies the ratio like phi is psi in this kind of model, right? So, the situation is quite simple. So I have some modification in the oil equation actually alone. But okay, so let's consider some concrete model. So, so far I didn't specify the model, but I can consider some kind of specific model for the dark energy and dark matter. So now I, we learned that, so the effect of the coupling appears on the oil equation as a coupling of F comma Z, but the Z is minus one on the background. So F comma Z is just constant. So I call this part is B. So B is just constant, the coupling constant. And then I assume that the energy density is given by this. So I have some cosmological constant low lambda plus additional kind of term, which correspond to like dark fluid. So I call like low DF for this kind of fluid. So, so basically this dark fluid has a density, low DF like this, and EOF equation of state, WDF is CD squared. So, so basically I can consider like dark relation. The reason why I consider this kind of dark fluid is that, so, so the introduction of this kind of dark radiation can reduce H not tension. So I want to consider whether this new term can reduce H not tension. So the dark energy pressure and equation state is given by this, it's very simple. So in the regime like rho df is much larger than rho lambda in the early universe, like dark fluid density is much larger than rho lambda. So we find that PD is CD squared OD and W is CD, CD squared, so at early time. So if CD squared is one third, this dark energy behaves as a dark radiation. Okay. And this possibly this may alleviate the upper tension. Yes, so in the late universe, so rho lambda dominate compared to rho df. So we find that PD is minus rho lambda and W is minus one. So in the late universe, okay, uh, dark energy equation state approach is cosmos constant one. But in the early universe, there is kind of modification. So in the early universe, it behaves like dark fluid. Okay? And in the late universe, it behaves like almost like cosmos constant in this scenario. So this is a model. And so, uh, so regarding the evolution of the perturbation, so you can estimate actually in the strong coupling regime. For example, if the coupling B is large, much larger than low C, uh, this coupling has a dimension of the energy density. And if B is much larger than rho C, and rho C is larger than rho D, okay, then we can analytically show that the CDM and dark, en dark energy fluid move together. So basically, this is a kind of attractive solution like VC approaches VD. So in the strong coupling regime, so both CDM and okay, dark energy velocity potential, they behave in a similar way. This is something like uh, uh, CDM, uh, like CMB case, like the baryon, it's a, it's a baryon at a tightly coupled to photons. So the baryon velocity potential are similar to the photon velocity potential. Something similar happened. So in the strong coupling regime, so CDM and dark energy velocity potential behave in a similar way. And there is a dark energy effective sound speed, which is given by this, okay. And then for the more deep inside the sound horizon, where K is much larger than AH over C effective, the CDM and dark energy interaction leads to the modified equation for the CDM density contrast. So you see some modification 
which appears like Ro over B. And in the regime of weak coupling, okay, so in the early universe, so Ro C dominate over B. So B is constant, but Ro C actually increases to the past. So in, so in the early universe, it's kind of weak coupling regime. So in that regime, so this is just standard. So we have growing more solution where delta CN is proportional to A. But in the, at some point, uh, uh, this perturbation can enter the strong coupling regime, so where B is much larger than rho C. So in that regime, the interesting point is that the third term, okay, the source term, usually the gravitational source term, it actually becomes zero in that regime. So you find that you find that the growing mole solution is just like delta C n is just constant. So compared to the standard case where delta C n is proportional to A, so we have the suppressed growth of the actually C D N perturbation. So there is a kind of suppression for the matter growth in this kind of scenario, okay? Because of the actual momentum exchange between CDM that fluid. So we have some, okay, some behavior like VC is almost equivalent to VD and that leads to some suppression of the growth of the matter density contrast. So this is a kind of numerical kind of evolution. So if B is zero, so the CDM density contrast is green line grows in proportion to A yeah, but in the presence of the actual coupling, so when B is, B is negative, ah, B is negative is required to avoid ghost and instabilities. So as long as B is negative, so we can avoid some ghost and instabilities. Yes, and in that case, so we have some suppression of the growth of the CDM density contrast. It almost approaches constant. So it means that we have suppression. And you can see in the right figure that the two velocity potential, I, I like like theta C and theta D, okay, approaches okay, at late universe. Yeah, in the strong coupling regime, it approaches in the same value. So, so the, in this kind of scenario, the growth of CDM density contrast is suppressed by the interaction, by the momentum transfer between CDM dark energy. So you can see some suppression. So this may alleviate the sigma extension. So the, the final one is really confrontation of the observation. So, so our interacting dark energy dark matter model has a coupling constant B. So this offers a possibility for reducing the sigma extension, okay, as I said already. And also to address the Hubble tension problem, so we consider the dark energy actual density, which CD squared is one third. So then you find that, so that evolution of the dark energy to density, okay, I'm see, I see, Alex, yes. So I have this kind of behavior. So we, we have some low lambda plus um, the dark, dark energy, dark radiation kind of energy density, which is proportional to minus four. So the half potential may be eased by the existence of dark radiation. So compared to the lambda CM, our model has two additional parameters, B and omega DR. So I don't have much time. So I just saw show some kind of plot, so effects on the CMB temperature anisotropies. And so, so compared to lambda CDM, so in the presence of dark radiation, the power spectrum is actually modified. So it shifts to the smaller scale. So then actual H not tension can be actually eased but from this behavior. And also the coupling B also modifies the CMB power spectrum due to the presence of the, the dark matter interacting with actual dark radiation. So in the presence of the coupling, it also modifies the CMB power spectrum as you see in this figure. And regarding matter power spectrum, so you can see very strong suppression, okay, which is induced by the momentum transfer. So this is a matter power spectrum in comparison to the CDM. So, so as you can see in the left side of the here, so if you increase the value of B, and then there is strong suppression okay, on small scale. So the coupling B controls the amount of suppression for small scale power. And also if you vary the value of omega dr, so it the largest scale, which undergoes some suppression, is actually changes. Yes, so it also affects the matter power spectrum. So, so we did some likelihood analysis with Planck and barium acoustic oscillation and supernovae data, and finally we also include Planck's Nyakov David cluster count data. Okay. And then we did some analysis, and this is a result for the constraint on the half pole constant, and with dark radiation. Actually, larger body of H naught actually can be allowed. So when you have a look at these figures, so by in the presence of dark radiation, so large body of H naught can be really allowed. So just joint data analysis with Planck 2018 
plus BO plus supernovae give this bound. So H naught can be actually larger than 70. So there is an improvement compared to the lambda CD bound. So lambda CD bound is existing in a much kind of tighter range, but uh, now so larger value H naught can be allowed. However, if we increase uh, some Planck senior for the which data, it shifts H naught to again smaller values. So it's actually still, it's non trivial to elevate the Hubble tension completely. So, I mean, it shifts to the kind of smaller value again. Still, it's better than lambda CDM, but still it's not, not non trivial okay, to reach the region like H naught is 73. So, final one is the constraint of the interaction parameters. So, so without including Frank's Sunyaho Zerovich data, so if we only have the upper bound of B like this. And also, I mean, yes, um, and, but uh, if you include the Planck Sunyaho Zerovich data, so it actually gives some interesting kind of constraint. So, the constant value of B is, exists in the non banished value, actually. So, you can have a look at this kind of purple region, and B is actually non zero. So, this is kind of intriguing signature for the dark matter, dark energy elastic scattering. So, yeah, so we have some kind of sort of signature, so some interaction between dark energy and dark matter. And also, sigma 8 is reduced. So, then this model can really reduce sigma 8 tension. But regarding H naught tension, it's really non trivial. Right. So, I don't have much time now. So, okay, I finish it here. Thank you. So, this is a summary. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Shinji. Yeah, thank you, Shinji. We have thank time you. for one big question. Arman, please. Arman, unmute yeah. yourself. <laughs> I, I just clapped. I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> You're raising. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, one uh, still. Um, any question? Mm -hmm. Okay. If no question, let's thank Shinji once more. Uh, okay. Okay. And we are going uh, to the next to the next yeah. talk by yeah. Professor yeah. Arman Shafilu. Uh, I stopped sharing, so I think Arman can share. Yeah. Thanks, Shinji. Okay. Evidence for emergent dark energy. Okay. All right. So I think you can see my screen, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Starobinsky and Professor Polarski for inviting me to this uh, interesting session. And uh, last Marcel Grossman meeting uh, in Rome, we were hoping that to meet again. Uh, but uh, yeah, Corona happened and now we are all staying in our own places. I hope that for the next Marcel Grossman, we can be in a nice place somewhere in the world. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the evidence for emergent dark energy. A few slides for introduction. This is now a very known topic for the community, so I'm not going to do go through much details. Um, but uh, but yeah, we have the standard model of dark energy, uh, standard model of cosmology, which uh, consists of many different aspects. Um, we assume that dark energy is cosmological constant. Inverse is flat. We are in FLRW universe. We have dark cold dark matter. We assume that the primordial power spectrum is power law, and uh, practically with only six parameters, uh, we we describe the we describe the whole uh, universe, which is a very interesting model and a very successful model. The status of the model is pretty strong, I would say. Still, um, when we look at the model fitting different independent data, let's say uh, cosmic microwave background data or barren acoustic oscillation data or supernova data, it looks like that the model can uh, individually fit all these data pretty well. Uh, but the problem happens uh, when we look at the combinations. So, so it looks like that the standard model is a combination of reasonable assumptions. It works very well. Uh, but, but from practically last seven, eight years, and specifically after the first release of the Planck data in 2013, 
there was this issue arise that, uh, that the Planck was preferring Hubble parameter of about 67, assuming the lambda CDM model. And, uh, and at that time, uh, the local measurements from the Cepheid and supernova were about 72, 73. And, uh, and this problem got worsened uh, as uh, we got better data. So, so the current status is like that, you know, we have more than four sigma tension. This has been discussed, uh, you know, at numerous talks, even in this conference. So uh, yeah, so the local measurements are preferring a very higher value of the Hubble constant and, uh, and, uh, and the standard lambda CDM model fitting to the uh, CMB data prefers a much lower value. They are not really so different, but you know, since the error bars are small, uh, the tension seems to be now more than four sigma. Uh, one issue to, to remember is that it is not the only thing. Uh, the problem is that uh, we can see tensions in other uh, key cosmological parameters as well. Uh, as an example, uh, when we consider the weak lensing data, shear data, uh, and we just look at the contour plots of the sigma eight and matter density, we see that again, there is some kind of an inconsistency uh, between what we expect from Planck and what we see from uh, some of the weak lensing uh, data, including kids. And, uh, and in one of the analysis which we did a couple of years ago uh, with Xiao Leili, my uh, ex postdoc, and uh, Professor Starobinsky and Varun Sani, uh, we could see that even you can see a kind of an interesting tension in the uh, omega matter H square. And it's nothing to do with H0, it's like that, you know, there's a tension between. Uh, Baryonic oscillation Lyman alpha forest data and the Markov Markovic background. As you see in this one dimensional property distribution function, um, you know, the constraints which we get from the supernova plus BAO, including Lyman alpha, is pretty uh, different than when we include the uh, Markovic background. And all these together also tension with the Hubble parameter. So, so it looks like that we have a Hubble tension, we have the sigma 8 tension. Uh, we have this omega matter which is square tension, which might be a projection of some of these problems in another perspective. So, so things are pretty much complicated. I would say that even if we allow the curvature and uh, the anomaly of the A lens, which we see in the CMB analysis, things become even worse because uh, we know that the A lens is not really free parameter. And, uh, and if we just force it to be one, then we can see that, you know, a CMB data prefers uh, the curved universe. And uh, so again, none of these tensions are very strong, but, but when we look at the whole picture, we realize that there are lots of bits and pieces which are not really uh, well matched uh, with each other. Okay, now let's see and uh, how we can approach the problem. Um, so I can categorize things in uh, different classes. Uh, one of them is that, okay, to, first of all, to make sure that there is a serious problem with the standard model, um, we should find for features or deviations in the data beyond the flexibility of the standard model with a very significant statistical significance. So that would be great if we can do that. And that's what many people are doing, including us, uh, by looking at the model independent reconstructions. If we can use litmus tests or null tests to falsify the standard model to say yes or no, that would be again very interesting because uh, we can use the power of the data to just falsify the standard model for us. And uh, we can find tension among different independent data. Again, this would be useful to test the reliability of the model fitting to different data and making sure that there is no systematics between different data. Or we can theoretically or phenomenologically come up with a new alternative. And this alternative, if it works better than the Lambda CDM model, statistically, that would be a very important uh, achievement. But the point is that the standard model is a very minimal model. It has only six parameters and uh, it would be very difficult to beat this model by, uh, by let's say Bayesian evidence, which is the most standard tool that we use to compare different models. Uh, okay, so um, I'm just trying to say that, you know, uh, all these approaches, let's say litmus test, we introduced something, for example, a couple of years ago with Warren Sani Alexis Starobinsky, which is called Omacha Square. And, uh, and at that time we noticed that, you know, we have about more than three sigma tension between uh, different data. Um, we thought it's systematic, you still it might be, but, but nothing really changed in the last uh, seven, eight years. And uh, the, you know, some of the data reduced slightly, you know, the mean value is slightly higher, but still I would say that the tensions are still there. So this is some of the analysis uh, Gogo Joel led uh, that uh, Benjamin and I am also included in this work. 
that, that we try to, to compare the tension between different data, assuming different model. And, and this analysis, it was again clear that the Lyman alpha forest is one of the data which, should, which shows some problems and also Hubble parameter. Uh, the situation didn't change much, you know, for the Lyman alpha forest, the results from the DR14 from the, for the bus collabor EBUS collaboration didn't change things much, as well as the, uh, you know, RIS analysis, the H0 measurements from the RIS group uh, to make things worse, you know, their mean value went to the higher values and even their error bars shrink. So it looks like that we are observing a situation with the multiple suspects. Um, there are lots of problems and, uh, and, uh, and it's not really clear that what is really going on. And, uh, and uh, we should find the strategy to find out how to resolve the tensions. One idea is that it might be statistical fluctuations, which we can say not anymore because, uh, you know, some of these tensions are really at high significance and it cannot be statistical fluctuations. Uh, systematics in one or, or some of the data, this is probably the most possible uh, option which we have uh, because, uh, because complication of the tensions and uh, it's not one tensions as well as we cannot really resolve these tensions by minimal modification of the standard model. It looks like that we are in a situation that we need to add numerous degrees of freedom to the standard model to solve all the tensions, which looks like that maybe there is a systematic in one or even more than one of the data. Uh, we can have the extended models, uh, which basically this is generally done. There are hundreds of papers in the literature. Uh, and most of the times what these models do is that they have more degrees of freedom and we have more degrees of freedom results to the larger confidence contours. And if you have a larger confidence contours, you have a better overlap of the contours. So it looks like that people are alleviating the tensions. However, it is not really the case because the mean values are not shifted. So it is okay to do that, but I think the community in general is overselling in that. And uh, by just saying that, oh, we are not in three or four sigma tension, but we are in two sigma tension, uh, which is fine, but, but it's not really solving the problem. So how to approach that? Uh, we have the standard model, which has all these characteristics. Uh, it, is, uh, it is flat, isotropic, homogene homogeneous, dark energy is lambda, power of the spectrum, dark matter section, FLRW. Which part should we touch? So there have been attempts in, uh, in uh, many of these pillars of the standard model, including many works that we did. Uh, but in this talk, uh, which I reached to half of my talk, um, I mean, I would like to focus on the dark energy part, that uh, what would happen if we want to play with the dark energy part and then see how can we play with the expansion history to see if we can you know, uh, make things better. So uh, we can have early and late. There were discussions about the early dark energy, including the, the, the work by the Markovnikovsky's group, Polintal, that they come up with this early dark energy model that you know you have the H0 RD values. Now you want to practically reduce the RD, then you can have a higher value of H0 by injecting some energy in the late in the early universe. So your Hubble parameter would be higher value. And uh, so the system looks like the logically should work. But we know we should realize that still we have more degrees of freedom and the data has lots of correlations, which is not visible by eye when we just look at the simple equations. And this was shown uh, by, by Colin Hill et al. last year that tension is not really resolved in this early dark energy models. For example, in this uh, group of models, uh, you know, for the lambda CDM, the mean value is about 67.2, which considering this early, early dark energy model with new CUP degrees of freedom, the mean value just increased to 68.2. So, so it's not really solving the uh, solving the problem, and uh, even though yeah the contours are larger and it looks like that we have less tension. So the strategy which we try to follow was trying to have something interesting. So it was, it is always fun to do something exciting in physical cosmology, and uh, and nothing seems more exciting than uh, ruling out or killing lambda CDM model, which is a standard model. So this is a good target, and fun. And uh, one of the things that we have to consider or assume or guess, I would say, or speculate is that one or some of the data might have systematics. So we didn't try to investigate on a model to satisfy all current observations and resolve all tensions. Because as I said, the, 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 the nature of the tension is so complicated, which most probably some of the data might have a problem. Uh, so we tried to make a gamble, you know, and said, that, okay, let's choose CMB and local H0 measurements, which are fundamentally different data, and they are not even anchored to each other. And, uh, and trying to find a model which can satisfy these two observations, and then see how they can satisfy other data. 
Uh, and we try to target the near future and not now. Uh, thank you, yes, five minutes. If the current data is reliable, the proposed model should work fine. And, uh, you know, but, but we want to see that the future data uh, can, can really rule out the standard model and uh, prefer this model. So also we wanted it to be simple and uh, maybe hint to some, uh, some theoretical model. So we come with this idea of the phenomenological emergent dark energy, which is a very simple idea, no dark energy in the past, and it appears as an emergent phenomenon. So it can be linked to some appearance of some things. It can link to the growth of a structure or whatever. We don't know yet. It's a phenomenological model. But the idea is that there's no dark energy in the past, and it just appears. So it's a work which we did with the Shao Lei Li, my postdoc. Now he's an uh, assistant professor in the Hebei Normal University. And, uh, and we showed that you know, at the current status, when we compare PEDE, which has no degree of freedom, by the way, uh, it has a tangent hyperbolic shape. Um, when there is no H0 prior, the, the, the evidence for the, for the uh, lumbar system is much better than the PEDE. But if H0 end up to be a value close to 74 with a tighter constraint, then PEDE would rule out lumbar system with a very high significance. So uh, I think the model was received well. There were people who worked on that and compared with the other model. One of the interesting things about PEDA was that it naturally prefers high value of the uh, Hubble constant. So it's not like that it has a bigger contours. It has a similar contours as lumbar system as we see here, but it naturally prefer high value of the Hubble constant. Um, we extended the model and we called it the generalized emergent dark energy model because PEDA and lambda CDM looks like a two model which have no connection with each other. So we tried to come up with an idea that a model which has both lambda CDM and PEDE as two of its options. So we come up with this generalized emergent dark energy that has this one parameter, which is called delta. The, the equation seems complicated, but for the delta equal to zero, we get LCDM, and for the delta equal to one, we get PEDE. So if I can have the probability distribution function of the delta fit into the data and see if which one of these values are consistent, that would be very interesting, and I can compare models. And let's not forget that if delta is greater than zero, it basically suggests an emergent dark energy that at some times in the past, the dark energy has emerged and uh, become prominent. We fit the data to different things. We know that this model would have effects on the ISW and, uh, and we know that it would affect on the, the growth of a structure as well as the expansion history. So we tried to fit the data with various data. First attempt, we tried to fit it just with a combination of the CMB and the R19. As we see, CMB alone, the model allows large value of 74, which allows us to combine it with R19. And as you see, the model practically prefer larger value of delta more than zero. And delta equal to zero is present along the CDM is basically four sigma out. The next attempt is that to have a full analysis using with the combination of different data. There's a work that uh, 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 Wang Kian Yang, uh, Eleonora, and uh, Supriya and us, we did together. And, uh, and then we try to combine various data to see how this model behave. And this is maybe one of the key results. Uh, when we have the combination of the data, let's say Planck JLA, Planck Pantone, but this is maybe everything together, Planck plus BAO, Pantone, R19, or plus JLA, JLA and Pantone, slight different. We see that, uh, that the lambda delta at more than two or three sigma prefer rule out the delta equal to zero. So it's a combination of the data. So it means that the data prefers an emergent phenomena than uh, no emergence, which is for the delta equal to zero. Of course, the model has one degree of freedom. The best is to do Bayesian evidence, and this is what we did. And, uh, and when you look at the log difference in the evidence, we see that, again, JEDA is strongly preferred with respect to the lambda CDM model. Just point R19, we get 12, which is extensively large. But in any other combination, including the combination of all data, we get the log difference of about six, which is pretty large. So. Okay, we will see what would happen, but I would say that uh, at the moment, uh, the emergent phenomena seems to be a reasonable candidate to explain different things. Of course, some of the data uh, may change. I expect that you know, we would find some systematic in some of the data, but, but uh, emergent phenomena for dark energy seems to be a, a reasonable candidate. So my conclusion, a standard model fits different data pretty well individually, but there are tensions among different combinations. Uh, H0 tension and some others seems remaining persistent in the context of the standard model. This can open ways for competitive alternatives. So, so yeah, it's good to, to be creative and come up with crazy ideas. Um, tensions are re not resolved with the minimal extension of the standard model. I think this is a very important point. 
So it is highly possible that there are systematics in some of the data. So if I have to bet, I will bet on systematics in not only one of the data, but in more than one. But we might also need new physics. So it can be a combination of both, and we don't know. So we have an open mind, we should have an open mind, and certainly we need new independent measurements and observations to help us to clear things up. Let's say for H0, using a strong lens uh, quasars or supernova to estimate H0 or using rational waves, that would be a very good idea to have a model, in, I mean, independent uh, measurements of the Hubble constant or, or, or expansion history. Um, strategically, the first target can be testing different aspects of the standard model. I think with the low quality of the data, it's always better to rule out the standard model well, rather than saying what it can be. It's good to be creative and come up with the ideas, uh, but that is, I think, very important. And uh, if you can focus the power of the data to say that it's ruling out the standard model, that would be very exciting. Uh, the next generation certainly is uh, going to open up lots of space for us. And uh, we will see by end of 2020 that uh, where we will be. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Arma. Thank you. We have time for one question. Arman, please stop sharing screen. Okay, sure. Yeah. So, one question. Okay. Okay. If no questions, let's thank uh, Arman once more. And we are uh, moving to the next talk by Dr. Ryan Kille. It will be, uh, let me, also, okay. Uh, testing Lambda CDM with EBOS. Please, Ryan. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Let me start again. Okay. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Keeley, a postdoc at um, CASI, the Korea Astronomy Space, Space Science Institute. Uh, I guess I would first like to thank um, uh, uh, David Polsky and Alexei Sorbinski for the invitation to give this talk. Um, I've been working in Korea for almost three years now. I'm working on various aspects of the cosmology, though I guess only in a few short days I'm going to be returning to the US um, to start another postdoc. Um, so today I'm going to be telling you about what we've learned about the about cosmology from the completed SDSS4 Extended Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey and how it complements what we know about cosmology um, uh, painted by other cosmological data sets, um, specifically in the context of the H0 tension. So the whole point of cosmology is to identify the energy content of the universe that's responsible for the observed cosmic expansion and growth of structure. So starting from GR, we can make basic predictions about how the various constituents of the universe, like matter, radiation, curvature, et cetera, would cause the universe to expand. Um, this brings us to the lambda CDM model, named for its beyond standard model components. Um, and ironically, perhaps, um, despite being unknown, these components are responsible for the most noticeable features of the universe. By that, I mean the present accelerated expansion of the universe, um, is explained by dark energy, and the existence of structures in the universe, like galaxies and clusters, requires dark, dark matter. Um, so, but of course, our job as scientists is to test what we think we know about the universe. So, to test the lambda part of lambda CDM, for instance, um, to test whether dark energy truly behaves as a cosmological constant or whether it evolves with redshift, we need to look at the lower redshift expansion history at greater and greater resolution. And only we need to measure the distance to galaxies more and more precisely. Um, so, the lambda CDM model actually works remarkably well for uh, um, explaining a variety of data sets. So basically with just six parameters and the known standard model physics, we can explain things like the production of light elemental nuclei at the BVN, um, so how sound waves propagate through the primordial plasma, we can explain how um, the various constituents of this primordial plasma decouple um, to, to create the observed um, cosmic microwave background. Um, and then we can further explain how the perturbations in the CMB um, grow to be the large scale structure of the universe, like how the observed galaxies um, in the sky are distributed. Um, so my point here is that just with the known standard model physics and just six more parameters, um, this concordance model of cosmology can really explain a bunch of really non-trivial physics. Basically, that is until we try and measure H0. So if we take lambda CDM and constrain six parameters with the CMB and then extrapolate through these results over more than three orders of magnitude in the scale factor, then we can predict that H0 is equal to 67.36. 
Um, so, but however, one uses a period, period, um, period luminosity relationship to measure distances of galaxies at cosmological distances, we find that H naught is closer to 74. Um, so this tension is becoming important enough to recheck basically everything we think we know about um, cosmological data sets, either in terms of systematics or intriguingly about new physics. Um, the fact that there is no obvious systematic that explains this discrepancy is why I think this is the most interesting question in cosmology. It could be the holy grail, uh, new physics, as, as I said. Um, so um, since the high energy physics at the CMB is very non-trivial and lambda CDM does explain it well, um, then it makes sense to check first if there's any low redshift physics that could explain this H naught tension. Um, so low redshift physics, just an evolving dark energy component, would naturally inherit all of lambda CDM successes with the CMB and can easily accommodate a high value of H naught. So the crucial test then is to check whether such evolving dark energy mod mo um, models are consistent with the guardrails of the H naught tension, specifically the supernova and BO data sets. Um, so, so um, the, the guardrails that I just mentioned are, are the, basically the, the BAO data sets and, this, and the supernova um, distances data sets. So specifically the EBOS and Pantheon measurements of these, of these quantities. Um, so um, so, so for, for, um, for the BAO, we basically have, we're measuring the BAO feature in the correlation function or the power spectrum um, for, I guess, basically five different tracers and seven redshift spins. You can measure the, um, the angular diameter distances to, and, 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 and both the Hubble expansion rate, both sort of um, roughly independently. Um, so, and similarly, this uh, Pantheon supernova data set constrained luminosity distances um, out to redshifts that greater of greater than zero, um, greater than redshift one. Um, and so, you we have these uh, low redshift constraints on the expansion history, basically out to redshift of two or so. Um, and and th th these will basically be the guardrails to check any sort of um, to check any potential solution to the H naught tension. Um, so the basic strategy for, um, for, for trying to explain this tension um, is to try to throw everything we can think of at the wall. Um, so, we, so we have this tension between lambda cdm physics and um, constrained at higher shift and a local expansion rate um, constrained, um, which have constraints on the shape of the expansion history at lower shift. Um, and basically we can use these lower shift data sets to um, constrain the, uh, the interpolation between the, the, between the two ends, the, the two ends that are in tension with each other. Um, so the strategy for this analysis is then to be basically as, as, as agnostic as possible and search for any low redshift physics, um, namely curvature or an evolving dark energy that could resolve this tension. So by being very agnostic about the nature and evolution of dark energy, for, for instance, we can be complete, as in if we conclude that in our agnostic parameterization that there is no solution, then we can be sure that there can be no low redshift solution to H-naught tension as a whole. Um, so I guess to be specific, I'll be talking about sort of three cases. First is the familiar um, curved CPL parameterization, where any evolution in the dark energy equation of state is found at redshift zero. Um, but then to generalize this last point to allow for evolution in the dark energy equation of state at any redshift, I also parameterize the dark energy equation of state with a series of Chebyshev polynomials um, and their corresponding coefficients. Um, so the first, first polynomial C0 is flat. Um, so the lambda CDM case would correspond to 1, 0, 0, 0 in this space. Um, Further, I also use GP regression to reconstruct the distances and expansion history that, guard, that the guardrails want, so doing things in a model independent way. Um, so GP is useful basically because it's non-parametric and thus is flexible. Um, it's particularly flexible enough to find surprising results as in unknown unknowns should they um, exist. Um, uh, rest in health um, So I guess allow me a brief aside to talk about GP regression. It's sort of my pet inference technique. And I do think it can be useful um, for everyone. So a Gaussian process is a random distribution that generates a function as opposed to a single number. Um, this is distribution of functions is characterized by a covariance function, which is in turn parameters by a set of hyperparameters, which determines how the generated functions differ from the mean function. So in, in, this, in, this, um, in, in the displayed uh, notation, that random function is gamma. Um, so an instance of the GP draws is, is basically a hyperfunction. It generalizes the expansion history of the universe to something beyond lambda CDM. So, and so thus typically I take, typically choose lambda, C, as lambda CDM expansion history to be the mean function of, the, of this GP analysis. Um, and so the regression part of this GP, GP regression that involves training these samples based on how well they fit the data. Um, so this whole process can be basically summarized by this Bayes equation with a random H of Z function in hand. Our data sets, it's easy enough to calculate uh, a likelihood 
And then we can over, um, basically marginalize over the um, infinite dimensional function space of the Gaussian process by, by just sampling from it. Um, and so the, the primary utility, I would say, of GP regression is to test whether the data are consistent with the input mean function or whether there's additional information in the data sets. So essentially, by calculating the posterior of the hyperparameters and then saying if sigma f, this parameter which controls the y-axis of the deviations away from the mean function, whether that sigma f is consistent with zero. Um, so for an arbitrarily small sigma f, the Gaussian process will generate expansion issues, which are in turn arbitrarily close to the mean function. So then if we can be a bit clever and choose the best fit lambda CDM model to the mean function, um, thus if the data prefer something beyond that, then we can robustly say that the entire lambda CDM model is ruled out. Um, so when we actually do this, it's a bit um, disappointing perhaps, but there doesn't seem to be a case with the existing data. Uh, we see here the, high, uh, the posterior of the hyperparameters uh, where the color corresponds to the negative delta log posterior and the white lines correspond to the one, two, three sigma contents levels in solid dash and dotted lines. Um, so the data used here are the Pantheon supernova and the SDSS BA data sets. Um, and the mean function is best fit lambda CDM expansion history to those data sets. Um, and so the, the fact that uh, the, the one sigma contour is basically consistent with um, sigma f equals zero, as in sigma f equals zero is within it, um, then we can sort of robustly, then we can conclude that uh, the lambda CDM is consistent with the two data sets jointly. Um, there's basically no additional preference for something beyond lambda CDM in, in just these data sets. Um, um, but that's not to say that these data sets alone say lambda C CDM is the only thing allowed. There is a fair bit of flexibility still allowed by these data sets. So in this figure, um, particularly the, the blue bands correspond to like one and two sigma confidence regions from the Gaussian process. And the orange corresponds to the same um, confidence regions from the lambda CDM model. Um, so you can see that the supernova plus BO data sets basically allow for flexibility beyond lambda CDM, though perhaps there's no preference for it at this moment. Um, uh, so, so since Gaussian processes don't really have enough information to make full use of the CMB, um, from, so from here I'll focus more on, I guess, the curve CPL um, parameterization and focus on, on that as a possible explanation for the H-naught tension. Um, so in this figure here, in olive and navy colors, we can see we see constraints on H-naught RD from the BAO and supernova data sets. Um, as with the case for Gaussian processes, generalizing the lambda CDM case to the curved CPL increases the size of the constraints. Um, and, and, and in um, sort of lighter green, you see the shoes constraint on H-naught. Uh, the common story for these plots is that since the CMB constraints are dragged so well um, to merely a fraction of a percent, then um, the three data sets, the CMB, um, the CMB, and specifically their R drag value, um, the BAO plus supernova and H naught basically create a triangle where at most two of the three can be satisfied at once. And that narrative is, is borne out if you look at the lambda CDM fit to the Planck data set in red, um, which is sort of very small here. Um, though, however, you might be a bit misled if you were to look at the curve W naught W case for the CM CMB and BAO data sets um, on their own. Um, so specifically with this uh, with this gray here and with the olive, you might think that there does seem to be some sort of overlap between the three data sets, um, namely right here in the in the, in the center. Um, so, but but I guess the but however, then if you were to look at the the joint constraint of the three data sets here in blue, uh, you were just, you would see that um, it things are basically pulled back to the lambda CDM case, um, and so the the um, the reason for that is basically. Um, the, this curve W not WA parameterization basically introduces a lot of non-trivial degeneracies between these new degrees of freedom. Um, so for instance, the CMB contains H naught primarily through theta S and it's relatively straightforward to keep data S preserved while also keeping a high H naught value. You simply meet, need some sort of a phantom equation of state. Um, so however, the degeneracies in the CMB and then the BAO plus supernova data sets, they're basically in opposite directions such that when all these data sets are considered jointly, they converge back to a narrow region around the lambda CDM parameter space. Um, and this thus very only very marginally shifts H naught. Um, so again, I would I guess I would point out the blue um, the blue constraint. Um, and, and this story is basically categorically the same for the Chebyshev case I mentioned earlier, where the additional Chebyshev polynomials don't really seem to be doing much work. Um, it's basically just the first one that seems to be constraining the lower shift expansion history part. Um, and they Basically, converge back to the same the same kind of information where um, 
where, where, where they all sort of converge around the Lambda CDM case. Um, so zooming in on, I guess, this curved CPL case, we can see here this posterior for omega matter and W naught, which are probably the most important parameters when talking about the H naught tension. Um, and so the color in this plot, plot here um, corresponds to H naught. Um, and I think this plot in particular is very useful because I think it, it highlights a, basically the, um, all the degeneracies that are going on with, uh, with, with the, these various data sets and this H naught tension. Um, and so to understand the direction of these correlations, um, so the omega matter H squared constraint from the CMB is basically roughly independent of the redshift of, the, of any sort of low redshift constraint. And thus any modification, lower, low redshift modification in particular, would, that would increase H naught, um, then necessarily must, must come with a decrease in omega matter. Um, so that's basically why the yellow and the left-hand side of the spot, I guess why you see, why you see yellow on the left-hand side of the spot. Um, and similarly, since theta S um, must also be preserved, um, and is and again is basically roughly independent of any low redshift physics. Um, then, to, uh, then then that basically translates to so so that then if you're only introducing low redshift physics, then a constraint on theta s roughly then translates to a constraint on the angular diameter distance at z star. And so making no other change, increasing h naught would decrease d a of z star. But if we have w of z less than negative one, then that would decrease h of z at intermediate redshifts enough to leave d a of z star unchanged. And that's basically any sort of phantom kind of dark energy on its own is a reasonable um, solution to the H naught tension if you're just talking about this, um, the CMB and H naught. Um, but basically, all these other kinds of changes are um, too constrained by the BO and supernova data sets to allow for things like H naught of 73 or 74. Um, and so, I guess I'm coming to my conclusions where I guess the important part is that um, for the CMB and BEO data sets um, considered alone and the CMB uh, again considered alone, there's these large degeneracies in these extended parameter spaces. Um, but when they are, but because those, those degeneracies are basically in opposite directions in the, this new extended parameter space, the BEO and supernova um, when considered, the three data sets when considered jointly seem to then converge again around Lambda CDM. Um, so that the I guess so so that even though there's no preference for curvature or like an evolving dark energy in in these large extended parameter spaces, there are still some some um, so, some amount of flexibility allowed. Um, and so taken together, I guess basically I, I guess I, I I would then say that there's basically no low rich low rich of physics solution that can solve the H naught tension. Um, uh, thanks for your time. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ryan for this interesting talk. Actually, your final con conclusion just coincides with the, with the, with the recent paper with teacher, the forum teacher, et cetera. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, we have time for e questions. Okay, are there any questions, remarks? Uh, Thank you, Ryan, once more for uh, finishing your your talk early in time. <laughs> I'm Thank, you, Thank you very much. Okay. If no questions, uh, uh, was there any question by uh, from Benjamin? No. Okay. No. Well, no, no, okay. I was clapping. <laughs> Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> then let's go to the next talk by Professor Mikhail Volkov. So, uh, uh, anisotropy, anisotropic cosmological models in Horndesky gravity. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, okay, yes, fine. yes. yes. I uh, so, so uh, this is based on on, uh, on recent work with with uh, Alexei Stravinsky, Sergei Sushkov, and a couple of uh, younger guys from from University of Kazan in Russia. Uh, so uh, that is so we were able to detect a curious phenomenon in uh, in the context of of Hardensky gravity. And so that is this. Uh, so first, uh, known things. 
Let's consider a simple uh, homogeneous and uh, anisotropic Bianchi one cosmological model. So the metric is uh, contains three scale factors, A1, A2, and A3. And if they are different, uh, then the, 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 the universe is anisotropic. So one can uh, define the, the, the common as a sort of average scale factor, which, which determines the volume and the Hubble and their shears or anisotropies, beta plus and beta minus. And then Einstein equations boil down to, to, to the Friedman equation, which, which determines the Hubble rate and to the uh, equations for the shears, which are total derivatives. And then they can be integrated once uh, by expressing beta, so it should be beta dot uh, as a one away a, a cube and multiply by, by integrated, uh, integrated uh, integration constants. Now, if you take this solution and plug it back in, into the Friedman uh, equation, uh, then we get this uh, result. And then we hear that the first two terms on the, on the, on the right, uh, they uh, uh, descri describe the anisotropic contribution. And this uh, contribution decays as one over A to the six. Therefore, uh, anisot anisotropy becomes negligible at late times when A, A is large, but by the same logic, they become important at early time uh, when A is small and this uh, anisotropic contribution is expected to be larger than the, than the contribution of, of the other forms of matter. Therefore, the, the, the original state of the universe before inflation is usually expected to be strongly anisotropic. And this is a very simple argument. Seems to be always true. However, we, we discovered a different, uh, a different uh, thing in, uh, in Hardansky gravity. So we considered uh, uh, first a particular Hardansky model. So I remind you that Hardansky theory, this is the most general theory for the gravity, gravity coupled scalar field uh, in which equations of motion are of second order at most. And so in the simplest case, uh, there is the following Lagrangian, there is a, 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 a gravitational term and the following uh, unusual coupling between, uh, oh, sorry, uh, something is wrong. Uh, 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 coupling between uh, between uh, uh, the scalar and uh, the the Einstein tensor, and there is also a standard contribution and the, and the lambda term. Now, in the isotropic case, so when the all scale factors are the same, and then the scalar field uh, depends only on time, the uh, Friedman equation for the Hubble uh, boils down to this. Whereas the scalar field equation in this case, it is a total derivative, which can be integrated uh, uh, given the following result. And then on the right, we have integration constant, which can be called a scalar charge, C, C phi. Now, if this uh, charge vanishes, then the left-hand side must vanish, which is possible either if uh, phi dot is zero or if this bracket is zero. And this gives rise to the to different solutions uh, of the problem. So if I dot is zero, we get the expansion with the, to, with the constant Hubble rate determined by the uh, lambda term. Whereas if uh, this bracket is zero, we also have a, a expansion with a, a total, with a constant Hubble rate. However, the Hubble rate is not determined by, by, by lambda. So lambda doesn't, does not appear anymore. It's, to, it's, it's totally screened. So the Hubble rate is rather determined by the coefficient alpha, which arises here in front of the kinetic term. And so some, for this reason, sometimes this, uh, this is called kinetic inflation. And so this is theoretically interesting because one can speculate that this alpha is the result of some quantum corrections. So, so, so it's a small number. And then therefore the, 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 the inverse lambda is large. And uh, so, so the, the, this determines a uh, large Hubble rate. Now, this is if the uh, scalar charge is zero. If it is not zero, then these two equations uh, uh, describe solution which interpolates between the kinetic inflation in the past and usual uh, inflation in the future. And uh, so it's, it's, it looks something like that. So the typical uh, solutions, so the Hubble 
is uh, is is constant in the past and constant in the future, and these two constants are different. So the future constant is determined by lambda, whereas the the past constant is determined by by kinetic inflation. So all this is very interesting. However, uh, there, there is a problem because if you analyze small fluctuations uh, around this background, then we discover that the speeds of sound in the scalar uh, and the tensor sectors become imaginary uh, at uh, early times. So therefore, the, the solution is unstable. Uh, but uh, at the late time, everything uh, turns to one, and in particular, the uh, tensor uh, speed, even though it's not equal, equal to one, it, it approaches unity very, very fast, such that the, 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 the deviation from, from unit value is, is, is of the order of, of, the, of the ratio of two Hubble's, which is an extremely small number, much less than the, the, than the experimental bound obtained by LIGO. Now, all this can be uh, mapped to host, which is maybe not interesting, I skip it. Uh, but what is interesting is uh, anisotropies. Let's get back to, to uh, Bianchi one, and here are the equations. So if there are shears, then we get the, the Hubble, uh, so, so the three null equations for the Hubble rate, equation for the scalar field, and also the shear equations can be integrated, uh, given, uh, so given rise to integration constants. And this last equation uh, uh, allows us to, to express shears in terms of, 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 of the other quantities. And here we discover the following thing. If A is small, then the second uh, factor becomes very large. However, it is possible that the first factor becomes very small if a phi dot tends to infinity, close to approaches infinity, uh, close to singularity. And if this is the case, then the anisotropies are not amplified. At the uh, at small times, they they remain small, and in fact, this is what actually happens, because uh, when we analyze these equations, uh, they can be solved in, in parametric form because, after all, these are algebraic equations, and if you plot the solution, when then we discover that this amplitude s, which describes the anisotropies, vanishes both at late times and at early times. So at, at late times it vanishes naturally because because anisotropies uh, vanish at, uh, at late times, but at early times it is proportional to a cube, and therefore no anisotropies. And then finally, at the end of the day, of the day, the universe is anisotropic only during a short period at intermediate times. During a short period of time, uh, short period of time, which becomes a, a shorter and shorter if we oh sorry uh, if we uh, uh, because when we uh, increase the anisotropy uh, amplitude, the Hubble gets uh, larger and therefore the period of anisotropy shrinks. And so anisotropies uh, really are localized in the, in, in, uh, in, in somewhere over here. And so, in, and so the, the, the original state of the universe cannot be anisotropic in this case. However, it cannot be uh, isotropic either because we know that uh, the, if it's isotropic, then it should be unstable. Uh, there is a gradient instability. Therefore, we conclude that the original state of the universe in, in this model should be inhomogeneous, which uh, describes, uh, which opens an interesting issue to study, but, but this is a separate story. Now, uh, next, we move to general hard density theory, and then we analyze the full hard density Lagrangian, which contains four arbitrary functions of G2, G3, D4, and D5, functions of phi and of x, which is the square of the gradient of phi. And this requires some analysis because in this case, uh, uh, everything becomes complicated. However, the equations for, for, the, shear, uh, for the shear still can be integrated uh, once and still there are integration constants and still there we can solve uh, for the shears. But the problem now is that the equations for the shears become non-linear unless this coefficient vanishes. So first we consider the case when it is zero. When it is zero, then the anisotropies are, are given by the formula, uh, following formula 
where this function in the gen gen denominator is, is, is up to us to, to choose. Uh, and when we choose it it, it, it determines the G4 and G5 functions uh, of the Hardensky theory. And in the simplest case, well, when it is constant, then the anisotropies are uh, like this, and then they, they are not screened, they are amplified at, at the singularity. And the corresponding theory where this happens turns out to be almost everything people uh, consider. So in particular, uh, it is, it is uh, usual general relativity. It is general relativity with the, with the conventional scalar field like in photon. This is a K essence, also called KGB theory. Uh, and so all this, uh, in all these theories, <coughs> anisotropies are not screened. These are usual theories where anisotropies grow uh, uh, at the singularity. And, uh, and the speed of gravity waves is constant in all these theories. In order to get something interesting, we have to consider more general uh, Hardensky theories, which include uh, uh, second derivatives of the scalar field quadratically or cubically. We need these terms. Because so if you, if you consider only this term, it doesn't work. But with this quadratic and cubic terms, it works. And in particular, so it works for, for the previously considered uh, case. Uh, so it, 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 so the, it, it is a Haransky model, which I described uh, seven minutes ago. But it also works for other cases. And in particular, we analyzed some other more, 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 uh, some other more general Haransky theories, which nobody studied up to now. And by doing th this, we discovered one more theory, which also shows the kinetic inflation uh, phenomenon, but in addition, it is more stable. So uh, we discovered that it's completely stable in the scalar sector, but still there is a gradient of stability in the tender sector. But this is a, a good news for us because maybe, this suggests that maybe one can adjust these uh, functions G4, G5 in such a way that it becomes completely stable. So this is, this is possible. So, so in fact, there are good indications. Uh, well, uh, uh, there is some, so, some issues with, so the, the, so the, so the, the anisotropy, uh, anisotropy so because equations are nonlinear, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting the issue of the anisotropies, but, but, but still they, they're always uh, screened at, at late and early times uh, and have a maximum in, in between. And finally, we studied the case of uh, non-zero spatial curvature. So not, not only Bianchi one, but this time we jumped to Bianchi nine. In the Bianchi nine case, uh, uh, use, again, using the, 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 the original simple uh, Hardensky model, the metric is uh, expressed in terms of, uh, so, so again, there are three scalar factors, uh, but, but, but there are also uh, omegas, which are invariant forms on S3, uh, maurer katan forms. And as before, the, the, there is a scale factor and shears, and, uh, but this time the, there is a potential for, for the shears. So, and then the equations, <coughs> there is. So there is a, a Friedman equation, and then the anisotropy equations can, can no longer be integrated because there is a, uh, there is a potential, uh, the, the shear potential which arises on right, and so it's no longer a total derivative. Now, in the simplest case, where, uh, where the scale is zero and then the anisotropy is vanish, uh, then there is a simple solution. It is the sitter. Because in this case, the, 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 the anisotropy potential becomes constant. It's just one in these units. And, uh, and, then, the, uh, and then there is a the sitter. And it looks like bounds in these coordinates. So it, it, it's, uh, it's uh, described by Koch. And so the universe are kind of shrinks up to a minimal value and then expands, yeah. Now, if you switch on uh, small anisotropies, then it's still bounds, but, but there are some, uh, some ripples, uh, so one can integrate numerically in this case. Uh, but, but, but the position of, bound, of the bounds shifts towards uh, singularity. And finally, when we increase the uh, anisotropies, uh, so uh, the bounds disappears, and instead we get a singular cosmology with the initial singularity. 
and it approaches singularity via the in infinite sequence of, of uh, oscillations. And this is the famous uh, Belinsky Halatnikov Lipschitz phenomenon, the uh, billiard. Uh, so, uh, uh, universe uh, shows in, uh, cycles, oscillation cycles, and during each cycle, this de derivative is, is roughly zero, and so, uh, and so therefore the, the universe is, is, is roughly Bianchi one, is roughly Kasner, more or less. Uh, and, uh, and it's not Kasner only during short period of time where, 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 where C1 changes. Uh, okay, now oh, this is vacuum case. What happens if he adds a scalar field? Does it, does it really be the same or not? And uh, <laughs> surprisingly the same. When we integrate our equations numerically, we discover more or less the same phenomenon. So here is a numerical plot. Uh, and when we see the, we see that the three scale factors, they uh, they oscillate, and then then there are periods where they are traced against uh, log log of a. They are more or less linear functions. So, so these are Kasner periods. So uh, and uh, so, so during the, this period, these are all, all of them Kasner, and then the, and then the Kasner exponents change uh, at this point, whereas the scalar field oscillates in some way. This uh, 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 seems seems to contradict uh, to, to contradict what I, I said before because before I said that in uh, Bianchi one anisotropies are suppressed and here they are not suppressed, but there is a catch. In fact, when we express the scalar field in this case by in terms of its charge, then we discover that the uh, non-zero uh, uh, curvature, curvature uh, spatial curvature gives the following contribution to the denominator. And during this term, the phi dot uh, grows for small, small a is one, one over a instead of one over a cube. And this growth, one over a growth is not enough to suppress anisotropies. So therefore, the anisotropies in this case stay unsuppressed, and that is why the whole thing oscillates. So therefore, oscillations are not dumped, and the screening is removed uh, by spatial curvature. And then, the interesting question: if these oscillation cycles are, uh, are infinite or not? I think they are, uh, but uh, there is but this uh, should be checked because uh, the, there is a the result due to Kalatnikov and uh, Belinsky, uh, well, there, there are problems with scalar field, but, but I think in this case, it's infinite. So finally, here are my conclusions. So contrary to, to the standard belief, uh, the spatial anisotropies in, in cosmology called Bianchi one do not always grow in the vicinity of singularity. Because there are models, in particular, Hodensky models, uh, including quadratic and cubic terms uh, in the Lagrangian, in which case, in, 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 where this phenomenon, uh, where, where anisotropies uh, are suppressed. So that the, 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 the original state of the, of the universe is not anisotropic. However, it is not, not isotropic either because the models are, are, are unstable uh, with respect to inhomogeneous fluctuations. But uh, there are good indic indications that this, this may be removed. Uh, probably, probably instability may be removed. Now, and also this, this phenomenon of anisotropic screen uh, is removed by the spatial curvature as in, in the Duncan 9 case. Whereas in the standard uh, theories like uh, usual general relativity, inflation, usual inflation, so this effect is absent. So everything, so anisotropies are dominant uh, close to singularity. That's it, thank you. This, this was my message. Mm. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mikhail. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, we have time for e questions. So, so if there are questions, then please, uh, David, hi, how are you? <laughs> Hello. I see the questions by, from, Camille, Camille, you have your third hand raised. Uh, Camille, but one win. Do I have my, uh, I don't think I have my, <laughs> do I? So no, I don't have any question. 
Okay, 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 okay. 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 Fine. You have your hand raised. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so if no, if no questions, let's thank Professor Volkov on, okay. once more, and I pass okay. my um, uh, chairman uh, the the duties to to Professor Po Ilplatsky. Okay, thank you. So our next speaker will be Benjamin Millier. Please, Benjamin. I am uh, trying to share my screen. Okay. And the title is Reconstructing the Growth of Ex and Expansion History, the Case for Negative Dark Energy with a question mark. Uh, can you, sorry, can you yeah, see my screen? Yeah, we can see it very well, yeah, it's okay. Okay, all right. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to thank the organizer for putting together this um, session. Um, so today I'd like to, to talk about, um, or to show you how we can um, reconstruct the uh, expansion history uh, of the universe. Um, from the uh, growth of structure that can be um, measured by a large scale uh, survey and uh, a little digression toward the end uh, regarding uh, the possible presence of a negative uh, dark energy. Um, so yeah, uh, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Benjamin Lullier. I'm a, an assistant professor uh, at Sejong University in Seoul, Korea. Uh, and uh, my collaborators, uh, most of them are actually in this room, in the audience. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, OK, let's, uh, let me start. So we've had a few talks already. Um, so I can be uh, quick on the introduction. But um, so uh, we have our current model of cosmology uh, today, which um, basically uh, relies on three main pillars, namely that the universe is isotropic and homogeneous. Um, and uh, so if that's the case, then uh, the solution to the Einstein equation is the uh, friedman lemaitre robertson worker metric. Uh, the second pillar is uh, gravity, um, which uh, is described as by general relativity. And um, um, the third pillar may be uh, the fact that in the uh, youth of the universe, uh, the universe um, underwent a rapid expansion, uh, stretching the primordial fluctuation and giving rise to uh, the structures as we know them uh, today. Um, so if you look at the content of the universe today, it seems to be dominated by uh, almost 95% of uh, unknown, namely 70% of uh, dark energy, which we believe is responsible for the late-time acceleration of the universe, and uh, the rest being uh, matter, mostly uh, gravitationally, gravitational dark matter. Uh, the universe seems to be flat, um, and this is very well supported uh, by observation. We've had a few talks already, even in this session. Uh, we have nice concordance of different um, of different sets of observation. However, and uh, the model itself is very minimal with only a few, uh, a handful of parameters. However, uh, with the ever increasing quality of data, we start, uh, we have been seeing uh, the rise of tensions. Uh, we've talked about them too, the, mostly the Hubble tension, uh, the Sigma tension and so on. So it's time to uh, take a few step back and um, try to uh, maybe question all those uh, pillars of modern cosmology, um, maybe uh, questioning whether uh, the isotropy or uh, the nature of gravity. And today, uh, I'll be focusing mostly on uh, the nature of gravity. Um, so uh, most of the evidence that we have for uh, the late time acceleration comes from uh, type 1 is supernovae, um, where uh, we believe that there are standard standardizable candles, uh, which are sensitive to uh, the shape of the uh, dis luminosity distance. And um, so um, all the information or 
the information that we can obtain from this luminosity distance can be translated uh, into such kind of plot where you see uh, the matter content versus the equation of state uh, of, uh, of dark energy, uh, where we believe that dark energy is uh, responsible for the late time acceleration. Uh, but as I was mentioning in my previous slide, uh, maybe we got it all wrong. We don't really have a good explanation for dark energy. Is it a cosmological constant? Is it some fluid with negative pressure? So maybe we got it all wrong and maybe um, we need to modify uh, gravity. Uh, and therefore, that would be the, the core of my talk, um, basically trying to falsify uh, general relativity as our theory of, uh, of gravity. So to do that, I'll be using two main categories of tools. Um, model dependent versus model independent methods. Uh, so I wanted to spend some time explaining these uh, in particular. So most people are familiar with model dependent methods where uh, you have a model, you make predictions, you compare to the data. That's straightforward. Um, it gives you very strong constraint power because you um, you fix uh, the flexibility of, the, of your model. Uh, but the pay to price is that you will always get results that will be uh, biased toward the model that you assume. Um, as opposed to that, model independent methods can be less straightforward uh, and they can be prone to overfitting. So overall more difficult to uh, use, but um, they're interesting because uh, they give you more flexibility and uh, that can allow you to uh, to find unexpected features, but also uh, they won't be biased toward uh, a particular model. So I think um, I don't think these two methods are uh, competitive. Com sorry, competing together. I think uh, both uh, can be used and should be used uh, together. They just uh, serve different but complementary purpose. Um, okay, so let me uh, get started. So um, the growth of a uh, structure in um, general uh, or actually even in modified gravity can be uh, summarized by this uh, this equation the linear growth uh, of, of the perturbation where uh, delta is the uh, perturbation and um, observationally uh, that's not what we can measure what we measure is this product f sigma eight uh, where f is the growth rate is the log derivative uh, of the uh, of the overall density of the growth, and sigma eight is the uh, amplitude of the uh, of the fluctuation, and uh, so this is a uh, plot showing uh, the uh, growth of sigma eight as a function of uh, of redshift. This is the latest result from the uh, EBOS uh, survey, and um, I think this is not a, a fit. This is um, this is a prediction uh, from Planck, and uh, you can see how uh, well consistent it is with uh with uh, the uh, measurement in uh, data and error bars so um if you give yourself your expansion history and your uh, matter content of the universe and the amplitude of this situation it's pretty straightforward to go from uh, the expansion to uh, the growth uh, we've played this uh, exercise in these two papers uh, today, what I wanted to discuss was uh, going the other way around, go from the growth of structure, this F sigma eight, maybe I should have inverted uh, those two those two here. So you go from the growth of structure to, uh, and you deduce uh, the uh, expansion history. So uh, this actually comes from a uh, an equation uh, that was uh, uh, found by uh, Alexei Starobinsky. Uh, and uh, you see that if you give yourself uh, omega matter zero, the uh, matter density today, uh, and uh, sigma eight zero, which uh, allows you to translate f sigma eight into uh, the perturbation delta. And if you know the whole history of uh, the growth of structure delta and uh, its derivative, then you can obtain the um, expansion history uh, at any redshift in a way that's totally independent of dark energy. So you don't make any assumption as to the form uh, of dark energy. You don't need to assume uh, lambda or uh, any parameterization. So that's uh, pretty interesting. Um, so here is the, uh, the, the idea of, uh, of this work. You start from the uh, data, you use an algorithm to reconstruct the data um, and uh, that gives you a likelihood uh, so since we are looking at the growth data, you have a likelihood to the growth uh, of structure. And you apply this analytical 
uh, reconstruction from the growth to uh, the uh, expansion history and the distance modulus, you can then obtain a second likelihood, likelihood to uh, the supernovae data, and uh, you get a total uh, likelihood to the data, which allows you to constrain um, your uh, expansion, your growth histories, and uh, your two parameters, omega matter and uh, sigma height. So we played this game here um, using the so-called crossing statistics. So let me explain uh, a little bit. So we start uh, with a mean function, which is basically what we want to test. So in our case, uh, what we want to test uh, is the best fit to the data, um, the best fit lambda CDM, um, which is shown here in red. And uh, we're going to multiply it by uh, some hyper function. And uh, this hyper function will deform the data uh, oh, sorry, we we'll deform this uh, mean function, this rent mean function, into those uh, different uh, lines. And uh, each deformation will give a different uh, fit to the data. It will give a different likelihood. So um, we can then apply Bayesian analysis uh, on the uh, coefficient of those hyper functions to, uh, and see whether the data uh, prefer a deformation uh, or if they are totally uh, fine with this uh, best fit, which is uh, what I'm showing here. So I'm showing a um, uh, the posterior distribution of different parameters. So I don't know if it's uh, readable, but we have the matter density here. We have a uh, sigma eight uh, here, and the first two hyper, uh, the first two Chebyshev uh, polynomials here. Oops, sorry, this band is annoying me. Um, so first, um, we can see that uh, the posteriors on uh, omega matter and uh, sigma eight get uh, extended. This is uh, understandable because uh, of the uh, the flexibility that we give um, to uh, the data uh, or to the f sigma eight, uh, the growth reconstruction. But uh, more interestingly, um, we see that uh, the data are totally, the posterior are totally uh, consistent with uh, c zero equal one and c one uh, equal zero which is essentially no uh, deviation from uh, from the mean function, which was the best fit lambda CDM, okay? So it means that, um, so C0 equal one and C1, C1 equal zero is a uh, effectively multiplying by one, uh, which means that our, uh, our mean function, the best fit lambda CDM lies totally uh, within the one stigma region. So the data really do not require uh, any deviation from lambda CDM uh, for the expansion and general relativity uh, for the um, for the for gravity, although uh, it has much more flexibility, so it doesn't require any deviation, but uh, it allow it does allow uh, deviation. So in order to go a bit further, um, we use Gaussian process uh, regression to reconstruct this uh, f sigma eight, uh, which uh, was introduced a little bit earlier by uh, Ryan. So here the idea is the same. You go from uh, the RSD, the uh, F sigma eight data that you reconstruct using uh, GP this time instead of uh, of the crossing statistics that we did before, and you obtain uh, F sigma eight as a continuous function. You obtain your growth, uh, your likelihood to the growth data, and uh, from F sigma eight uh, you obtain your mod uh, distance uh, moduli, and you obtain a likelihood to the supernovae data. Um, so here I'm showing uh, the result. So here this is uh, F sigma eight as a function uh, of redshift. And uh, so the gray area here is, uh, is essentially all is an envelope that contains all reconstruction that give a better fit to the data than the best fit uh, lambda CDM model. And um, so, and I did use uh, the expansion history H and uh, the, uh, distance moduli. Uh, now what's interesting here is because um, uh, we made zero, remember that we made zero assumption uh, as to the nature of uh, dark energy. So since uh, the expansion is reconstructed from the data from uh, F sigma eight, and you feed, you need to uh, assume a value for uh, omega matter zero and sigma eight zero, or you vary those values. Um, then you have no guarantee a priori that uh, this quantity here uh, is positive. And in fact, uh, it does uh, become uh, negative. Uh, for instance, for a given, uh, for a given uh, expansion H, if uh, omega matter uh, is high, then uh, 
this quantity uh, will become larger than h square and you will end up with a negative uh, dark energy. Um, so we divide it into different cases uh, regarding um, the time when uh, dark energy first crosses uh, zero, which I'm going to show on this. So you can see it uh, better here. So case A is the blue case where um, uh, omega dark energy is always uh, negative and uh, the green and uh, purple cases, um, omega dark energy is allowed to cross uh, zero at a uh, redshift of one or a uh, redshift of uh, 0.7. Um, so what's interesting is that, uh, as I was mentioning uh, earlier, uh, high value of omega matter and low value of sigma uh, eight are uh, still allowed by uh, the data. Remember that all those reconstructions here uh, have a better k square to the data than uh, the best fit uh, lambda CDM model. So now um, we were interested in uh, looking more into the, the possibility of uh, negative uh, dark energy. Um, so uh, in uh, this paper, uh, we came up with a toy model um, in which uh, dark energy is uh, consists of, of two components, an X component uh, and lambda. So lambda is a, is a negative cosmological constant and is hidden behind a phantom uh, X component here. Um, so if you play with, uh, with this, you can find some interesting features. So for instance, uh, re depending on the, uh, the values of the um, negative cosmological constant and uh, the equation of state, you uh, may see the appearance of a uh, past acceleration uh, in the past, uh, which is not trivial. Um, now, if you fit it to the, to, to, if you fit this model to the data, so here we use the BAU uh, from uh, EBOS, we use uh, type 1 supernovae from Pantheon, we use uh, Planck and uh, H naught. And uh, so this is the uh, posterior um, uh, H0. And uh, so in case of uh, lambda CDM, you have, uh, obviously, uh, you prefer uh, low value uh, for, uh, for H0. But as you add uh, this degree of freedom, um, you uh, allow uh, for a late time uh, change in the expansion history that uh, allow uh, slightly higher uh, higher values for H0. So uh, the point here is uh, is not that we uh, solve the uh, Hubble tension. Uh, we do get slightly higher, but it's uh, at the expense of uh, extra degree of freedom, and uh, we don't really solve the tension. What's interesting uh, is really that uh, this kind of, uh, of solution is not excluded by the data, and it gives uh, similar evidence uh, to lambda CDM when we compare to the data. All right, so uh, I think I'm about uh, the end of my talk. So let me summarize. So I've shown how we can uh, independently reconstruct um, the expansion history from the growth, uh, making no assumption uh, for uh, the nature of dark energy. Uh, so the current data are consistent with, uh, so I didn't talk about the rest, but uh, basically uh, as a general relativity, as gravity, uh, but it still has uh, leaves room for uh, deviation. Uh, we studied the case of a negative cosmological constant, which is hidden by, behind a phantom uh, dark energy. Uh, and we showed that it's uh, not ruled out uh, by the data. So that was uh, quite interesting. And um, so we are really looking forward uh, for um, to um, future surveys such as DAISY, which will put a really better constraint. It's particular on the growth uh, of structure. So let me stop here and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Benjamin. Maybe there are any questions? Uh, yeah, I have one question. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm Batul from USDC. Uh, I have one question. Actually, in 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 this in this work, I couldn't understand what what's the reason to get the three different cases for redshift. I mean, two, one, and point seven. I mean, why these particular numbers? Um. Well, those particular numbers are a bit arbitrary, but uh, the idea was we we wanted to uh, to see. Uh, so yeah, I didn't have much time to explain. Uh, but basically, we wanted to see how uh, this constraint of uh, 
requiring that uh, dark energy be positive, uh, how this would affect uh, the yeah. distribution or the allowed uh, region. And as you see, uh, so if you look at uh, case C, for instance, where uh, dark energy is, no, sorry, if you look at, uh, yes, that's case C, where uh, dark energy is allowed to cross a uh, redshift of 0.7 uh, from here. So it has to be positive before, but it's allowed to uh, cross um, zero from here. Then if you want that, you really need um, a high value uh, of uh, omega vert matter. And if, okay, that's uh, because of this, right? So to have negative dark energy, you need to have a high value in the numerator. Uh, so that you become larger than the, the numerator. And uh, if you have this high value of uh, omega matter, then it forces you to have a, a lower value of, uh, of sigma 8. So now if you release or if you are uh, less um, stringent for this constraint, so no, sorry, it's the other way around. If you are more uh, stringent, so if you look at uh, case A, where you require dark energy to be positive all the way through, um, then um, actually you can have, uh, this time you can have all uh, this region of the parameter of space, uh, which has low value for omega matter and high value for uh, sigma eight. And what I want to remind is that all of these values here, uh, they are authorized by the data. They do give a better fit than uh, lambda CDM. Okay. Thank you. Michele, you have a question? Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Very nice talk. I have a question on the previous slide because uh, if I understand correctly, you are basically used using RSD and uh, uh, supernovae to get constraints on the expansion history. Uh, my question yeah. is, have you, have you tried to compare your uh, um, forecast, uh, so your, your results on the expansion history on, on data on the expansion history to see how these uh, uh, reconstruction uh, compared with uh, uh, independent measurements. I'm sorry, uh, I missed it. Compare which reconstruction to what? Uh, the the uh, Hubble, um, the Hubble uh, parameter that you estimated in the middle. Um, okay, so we could, but uh, as you can see here, there is no H zero anywhere, right? Uh, so here, what we have is actually the shape of H. Uh, so this is the H, capital H of Z divided by H naught. Uh, so it's really just giving us the scale of the uh, evolution of H, but uh, we need to anchor it with uh, yeah. a value for H naught. Uh, so that would be one more degree of freedom in the analysis. Uh, I guess that would be doable, yeah. But maybe just to compare the, 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 the evolution, so the, the, the slope of this uh, H uh, with, uh, with data to just an independent test. Yeah, we haven't done it, but uh, yeah, that would be doable. Thanks. Okay, so thank you very much for the interesting talk. And so next talk will be by Luis Urena Lopez. Please uh, share your screen. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, okay. about track of quantum okay. field and the cosmological constant dynamics of a composite dark energy model. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, uh, this work is. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, to the organizer for the, for this opportunity to to give this presentation. This work has been done in collaboration with my colleagues Francisco Linares and Andan Roy. Um, you can also see more details uh, in the in the archive. Um, Yes, uh, this is the plan of my talk. Uh, I'm going to give a very brief introduction about the quintessence case because uh, I'm going to use a scalar field, but now with a phantom uh, behavior. And, uh, and for the second part of my talk, I will talk uh, about this uh, phantom case using this scalar field. I'm also, uh, I'm going to consider uh, the case of the of a joint contribution to the dark energy budget uh, given by the phantom field and the cosmological content. So uh, very briefly, the general setup for uh, quintessence case uh, is very well known. Uh, here, I'm just giving some details about it. Uh, uh, we can calculate uh, uh, the energy density uh, 
for this uh, quintessence field, uh, the, the energy density is given by two parts, a kinetic part given by the, by the um, time derivative of the field, plus a, a potential part given by a scalar field potential. Uh, the pressure is given very similarly, uh, but, but in this case, it is not the sum, but uh, uh, it is the difference between the kinetic part and the potential part. The equation of a state can be defined by the ratio of the pressure density and the uh, energy density. And the values for, uh, that this equation of a state can take uh, uh, are in the range uh, in between minus one and one. Uh, uh, it is known that under very generic conditions, uh, one can find uh, uh, that the kinetic energy is going to be much less than the potential energy. And the equation of a state is going to behave very closely to the cosmological constant case. It is going to have a value very close to minus one. So quintessence fields uh, are, uh, in this sense, a good model for, uh, to, uh, for the dark energy component in the universe. The, um, the equation of motion for the scalar field is given by the Klein-Gordon equation that you can see in the box uh, here, uh, but you have to define uh, the scalar field potential. Uh, so uh, for, this, for these uh, models, uh, you have to uh, choose a, a particular potential and you can calculate all the quantities of interest, like the ones that are shown in the plots, in the plots here, for instance, you can, you can uh, find the evolution of the equation of the state, the evolution of the density parameters, and you can also calculate observables like the anisotropies, the temperature anisotropies and the mass power spectrum. Uh, by the way, these are plots uh, that were taken from this work uh, on a quintessence uh, tracker model uh, that was presented 20 years ago in another uh, Marcel Grossman conference. Okay, so uh, let me give you details about the method that we use to study a, a more a general uh, quintessence models. Uh, we usually, uh, well, there is this uh, uh, definition of variables uh, uh, for the scalar field, but we uh, did a step, a step forward, uh, one more step, and we consider this polar transformation of the scalar field variables. Uh, you can see that there is this uh, new angle, uh, this new variable theta here, and there are two potential variables represented by y, y1 and y2, which are related to the derivatives of the potential. So um, uh, under this transformation, the klein corgan equation can be written like uh, in, this, in, in this kind of, uh, well, uh, uh, can be written uh, like this set of uh, differential equations for the new variables, uh, for this variable theta, for this potential variable y1, and for the density parameter. The prime here uh, denotes a derivative with respect to the number of e points. Uh, uh, very interesting is that uh, the new uh, variable theta is related to the equation of the state, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the equation of the state is given just by this simple relationship in, in terms of the cosine of this variable theta. We can also consider uh, linear density perturbations for the field. And there is a very similar polar transformation. I'm not uh, giving all the details here, but uh, the first equation uh, over here uh, is for the density contrast in the density field for the linear perturbations. And the second equation is for an auxiliary variable that is related to the velocity perturbation for the field. So, uh, 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 under this uh, uh, polar transformation, we can uh, uh, try to uh, study uh, many potentials, many scalar field potentials uh, using this general parametric form for the uh, potential variable Y2. In the table, you can see many examples that you can find in the literature uh, uh, for different functional forms of the potential. And you can see that uh, there is a closed form for this uh, Y2 variable. And uh, this, this closed form is uh, very similar in all the cases and is related to this general parametric form that we are using here in terms of three new parameters, which are alpha zero, alpha one, and alpha two. 
And you can do the inverse process. Uh, you can um, choose uh, different values for the for these uh, these alpha parameters, and from them uh, you can find the corresponding generic form uh, of the scalar field equation. We we call these uh, parameters acti active parameters because uh, they appear explicitly in the equations of motion. So. Um, this is very convenient because you don't have to choose a very particular form for the potential, but you can play around with the, with the values of these alpha parameters. So uh, a few years ago, we made a comparison of this parametric form uh, with data, and we found the, uh, these constraints that you now see in the screen. And um, the, the general, uh, the general result is that the alpha parameters uh, are unconstrained by the data. So uh, this means that the data uh, doesn't support much more complexity in the model. So the, uh, from this point of view, the most preferred value for the, for the active parameters uh, is zero, which is the simplest possibility that you can find for a, a, a scalar field potential. And the, uh, and the uh, functional form of the potential is the quadratic one. So uh, this was very surprising that uh, you, can, you can try to study uh, uh, any functional form and the data, the data is not going to tell you if there is any preference for any of, the, of, of your choices. Now let's consider the case of tracker solutions for quintessence. Uh, for this case, there is a very, uh, very nice result because the, uh, there is a general tracker condition. Uh, probably uh, you have heard about these uh, tracker potentials in which uh, the equation of the state of the scalar field is going to follow uh, the equation of the state of the dominant component in the universe. It's going to track uh, the equation of the state of the dominant component. So under our, for, or under our formalism, uh, under our uh, polar transformation, we found that the general tracker condition is given by this expression that you can find in the, in the green box. And the, uh, the, the tracker parameter is going to be alpha two. Alpha two is, is going to give the conditions for uh, the, tracking, uh, the, tra the tracking behavior of the equation of the state. In the plots in the bottom, you can see uh, the behavior of the, of the equation of the state uh, in terms of the scale factor. And you can see that there is an attractor solution, an attractor tracker solution for the equation of the state at early times. Uh, uh, during radiation domination, there is another value during matter domination. And the final value, the present values of the equation of the state they are going to depend on the values of the other alpha parameters, alpha zero and alpha one. Um, you can also see the phase space for the equation of a state. Uh, you can see again, this attractor behavior of the tracker uh, solutions and uh, that under certain uh, circumstances, under certain values of the other parameters, you will get different values of the equation of a state at the present time. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, and then we made again an, a comparison with the data uh, for the tracker condition. And we found uh, that again, two of the active parameters are not uh, constrained by the data, uh, uh, but uh, the, third, the third parameter, which is alpha two, which is responsible, remember, uh, for the tracker behavior of the equation of state, this parameter is constrained and there is an, an upper bound for, uh, for this parameter, which translates into an upper, uh, into an upper uh, bound um, for the uh, equation of the state of the, of the tracker uh, with the quintessence. And you can see that the result is that uh, the value of the equation of the state should be very close to minus one. And actually uh, the constraints on the other uh, physical parameters in the model are very similar to uh, the case of the standard cosmological uh, constant model. So let me change to the uh, phantom case. Uh, for the phantom case, uh, probably you, uh, you remember that there is uh, one difference with respect to the standard uh, quintessence in which the kinetic term in the energy density uh, is uh, negative definite. 
and also in the case of the pressure density. So uh, it is very convenient to use uh, hyperbolic uh, functions instead of the trigonometric uh, functions if you want to do a similar transformation of these scalar field variables. So you can see the new transformation here with hyperbolic functions, but the potential functions y1 and y2 are exactly the same as in the case of the quintessence uh, field. Uh, the transformation of the Klein-Gordon equation uh, proceeds in a similar way. Uh, uh, the transformation goes into a set of uh, first order differential equations, but now uh, uh, you find in the equations these hyperbolic functions and the equation of state uh, for, the phantom, uh, for the phantom field is given by this expression, given in terms of uh, hyperbolic cosine uh, for this theta variable. Uh, we can also work out the expression for the uh, linear density perturbations for the phantom field. Uh, you can see again that the uh, equations of motion are quite similar to the quintessence one. Um, again, the first equation is for the density contrast of the linear density perturbations, and the second equation is related to the velocity perturbations. Uh, the, uh, the density perturbations are uh, the behavior of the density perturbations is, uh, is characterized by an effective wave number. I don't have time to talk about uh, the different effects that you can uh, find uh, for different uh, values of the, uh, of the potential value of Y2, but you can find the details in, our, in, our, uh, in the preprint uh, indicated here. So uh, we were interested in, in having a tracker tracker behavior for the, for, the phantom, uh, for the phantom component. And the interesting result is that the tracker condition for, for, for the phantom case is exactly the same as for the quintessence one, except that now the, uh, the values of the alpha two parameter should be positive. Uh, in the case of the quintessence, uh, the values of the alpha two parameter were negative. And you can see uh, here a comparison in the behavior of the equation of state for the quintessence case on the left and for the phantom case on the right. And you can see that the behavior is pretty similar, except that the equation of state in the phantom case um, can take on uh, negative values less than minus one. Uh, but you can see the same tracking, uh, uh, tracker uh, attractor values at the early times and that the present uh, value of the equation of state will depend on, other, uh, on the values of the other uh, active parameters. Uh, again, as, 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 a, 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 as another case that we considered in, 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 in our paper is the possibility that there are, uh, that the uh, cosmological constant is also present uh, for the dark energy budget in the universe together with the phantom component. Uh, from, uh, from my point of view, the, the cosmological constant is also part of the, of the phantom component. It's, it is just a constant part in the, in the phantom potential, but you can also consider that this is the standard cosmological constant in the Einstein equations. So you can see in the plots uh, 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 different instances in which uh, you can see the evolution uh, in the phantom only case on the left, and you can see the joint contribution of the phantom of the cosmological constant on the right, on the right, uh, uh, on the right uh, side in, in this light, and in the middle you can see the evolution of the density parameters for the uh, for the phantom case, the joint contribution in the solid lines, and the, uh, con uh, the the density parameter for the phantom case and for the cosmological constant. Here I'm showing examples in which the cosmological constant is negative definite. So its contribution is also negative. So um, we made a comparison with um, some uh, data and the constraints that we obtained are summarized in this table. Very quickly, there are some, uh, uh, in the different columns, you can see different uh, instances uh, of the models. Phi represents the, the, phantom, the phantom field. And when, whenever you see phi plus lambda, uh, you are, you are, uh, we are showing the, the joint case of the phantom and the cosmological constant. You can see that the constraints on the uh, physical parameters, H node, uh, omega matter uh, are 
practically the same, but the effective equation of a state is uh, negative, uh, is less than minus one, um, as, as you can see in the, in the third row in this table. Uh, more important for me is that, uh, sorry, more important for me is the, uh, the comparison uh, between the models, uh, whether the models are better uh, in fitting the data. So you can see in the last rows, in the bottom rows, um, the difference in the chi-square, the minimum value of the chi-square compared to the standard cosmological constant. And you can see that uh, this difference is negative always uh, whenever the, uh, the, phantom, uh, the phantom field is present, which means that the, uh, the fitting to the data is better with the presence of this phantom field. We also calculated the base factor in comparison to the cosmological constant again, and we found a definite positive evidence uh, in favor of the presence of the phantom, of the phantom uh, component. Uh, just to show you the posteriors we obtained after the comparison with data, and you can see on the left, uh, the posteriors for the uh, physical parameters, H0, uh, the uh, omega, omega matter, and you can see uh, that uh, the, the constraints are, the posteriors are very similar in all the cases, except that there is a small shift uh, whenever the uh, phantom component is present. And uh, for the active parameters, again, we found that uh, alpha zero and alpha one are not constrained by the data, but the tracker parameter alpha two is constrained. And there seems to be a preferred value for this parameter. So um, the inclusion of the phantom field in general um, allows for uh, 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 the presence the joint presence of the, of the, of the uh, phantom, uh, phantom component uh, with the presence of, of lambda. And there seems to be a better fit, a better fit to data, but the uh, Hubble tension is unresolved. So uh, just for uh, uh, my, my last slide, uh, we found, again, I, I want to remark that we found evidence uh, in favor of the presence of the joint components, uh, the phantom and the cosmological constant. Um, most likely the cosmological constant should be negative definite according to uh, different uh, tests that we uh, made in our work. For instance, you can also try this uh, savage leaky density ratio. And again, there is Bayesian evidence in favor of a negative cosmological constant. So these are my conclusions. I have presented a general parameterization for quintessence and phantom models um, uh, given in terms of uh, uh, some parameters. And the main, uh, the main result is that there appears to be definite positive support in favor of a phantom equation of state and possibly a negative cosmological constant. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Luis, for this interesting talk. Are there any questions? If not, we thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Okay, and our next speaker will be Dr. Anwo Ko, who will lecture about cosmology with type 1a supernovae, searching for systematics and, non and model independent reconstruction. Please go ahead. Thank you. May I check if, if, if you can see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Everything is okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm, I wish to thank organizers for the opportunity to present our recent work in, the in this conference. My name is Hanul Gu, and I'm working with my supervisor, Professor Arman Shapilu, in Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute and University of Science. At I don't oh, sorry. Think I will go, but, but... please, please uh, uh, switch off the microphones, please. Okay. Thank you. Please go uh, ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'm working with my supervisor, Professor Amash Apilu in Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute and University of Science and Technology in South Korea. From now on, uh, I'll talk about our three recent papers with the title of Cosmology with Type 1A Supernova, Searching for Systematics and Model Independent Reconstructions. For more detail, please see the three papers on the slide. Um, first, I'll give a brief introduction about the studies. 
Typhoon and Supernova, in short SNE1A, are used as standardizable candles for seed distance measurement and have become one of important portion of modern cosmology. However, the standardization is purely empirical and requires SN1A Likert feeding model with a number of parameters and hyperparameters. The Likert hyperparameters are usually constrained based on assumption of cosmological model, but we can find model dependent manner to constrain the hyperparameters. In addition, to search for systematics in the SNE1A data, model independent reconstruction is required. After reconstruction, we can look for features in the data which can be a hint for systematics or new physics. We can also perform model selection and parameter estimation without comparing models. To do all of this, we apply the iterative smoothing method, which is the known parametric method to reconstruct the distance modulus and expansion history of the universe, and mentioned in previous talk by Professor Benjamin Luirier. It is introduced by Chapiello et al. in 2006 and improved by following papers on the slide. This method starts from initial guess of distance modulus, but generates modern independent reconstruction of distance modulus with lower chi-scale value after numerous iterations. We can find equations for each iteration, iteration on, bottom, on, the, on the bottom of the slide and more detail in the paper. Then to construct the distance modulus from the data and use them for constraining the Likert hyperparameters, we use the joint Likert analysis, in short JLA compilation, which have Likert parameters information based on South 2 filter, and apply the tree formula on the, on the middle of the slide. Among the parameters of the on the formula, two proportional factors, alpha and beta, and two absolute B band peak magnitude parameters, large MB1 and delta M, are Likert hyperparameters that need to be constrained why others are Likert parameters that provided by, provided by JLA. And we assume three different cosmological models for the analysis. One is lambda CDM, lambda cold dark matter model, uh, which have equation of state parameter, a parameter uh, with respect to redshift equals to minus one. And another is CPL, Chevalier, Polaski, and Linda parameter region which parameterize the equation of state parameter at low redshift. The other is PEDE, phenomenologically emergent dark energy model, which claims no effective presence of dark energy in the past, then emerges at later times, and mentioned in previous uh, Armand's, Armand Shapiro's uh, uh, presentation. We compare hyperparameter constraints of the three model that I mentioned in the previous slide with three different colors with those from the reconstructed distance modular, like colored in red. As you can see on the right, right corner plot, contours are all consistent with each other, which indicates that there is no dependence on model, on cosmological model. One exception is that large MB1, one of absolute B-bed peak magnitude parameters from reconstructions shows uniform distribution because SNE1A alone cannot constrain an absolute distance scale. Next, we divide the data into two redshift bins with equal, size, with equal sizes and compare the constraints from the reconstructed distance moduli. We can see that statistical deviations between the, between the two contours are not large enough, which indicates that there is no clear redshift evolution. Then based on the equations on the slide, we have derived the expansion history of the universe and two parameters which describe dark energy properties of reconstructions with higher, higher likelihood than that of the best speed lambda CDM model. We adopt the own parameter, which introduced by Sani, Shapiello, and Starobinsky in 2008. Since it is equal to the matter density at present time, when background model is the flat lambda CDM model. In other words, it can be useful to test the flat lambda CDM model. On this slide, top left panel shows relative deviation of weight thousand if reconstructed this as moduli from the best fit lambda CDM model with a constant shift, while others show reconstructions of the, of the other parameters derived from them. We have produced 20 reconstructions from each, each of the four different initial guesses 
and each of the 100 random Likert hyperparameter values. We find that reconstructions are consistent with the prediction of lambda CDM, allowing some additional flexibility. From now on, we talk about looking for features in SNA1A data using the more recent Pantheon data. We find oscillating features in the Pantheon data at redshift lower than 0 0.5 around the best lambda CDM model. They have tried to see how generic such behavior is found at many multiple color uh, realizations of the data using the full covariance metrics of the Pantheon data. On this table, the two circles shows that the deviations of the redshift bin best fit parameter values from their full data set best fit values are larger than or comparable to one sigma, which indicate oscillating features. We find that such features occur in four to five percent of Pantheon like simulations. We think that it might be a hint to possible systematic or new physics. Finally, we talk about direct model testing. We do this because model testing using Bayesian analysis depends on comparing models. We try to test consistency of a model and the data without comparing different models by estimating likelihood distribution of delta chi-square using iterative smoothing method for model selection and parameter estimation. For this analysis, we assume lambda CDM, PEDE, and the KIG model, which introduced by Corasaniti and Copeland in 2003. Based on previous works, we select certain model parameter values that are shown on bottom of the slide as an example. For model selection, we define delta chi-square as chi-square difference between smooth reconstructions and model best fit initial guess. Remember that the initial smoothing, uh, that the in iterated smoothing method starts from initial guess. We can see that likely distributions of delta chi-square for three different model best fits using 1,000 Pantheon-like mock realizations based on three different fiducial models are the same with each other which indicates uh, no dependence on cos cosmological models that are used for simulation. And for parameter estimation, we use the fiducial models and initial guess instead of best fit, best fit model for defining delta chi-square. You can see that on the, uh, in the red, red circle. In this figure on the slide, we can find that the likelihood distributions are the same with each other, which indicates no dependence on cosmological model again. This figure shows estimated constraints on matter density at present time for three different models using 95% confidence limit from Pantheon. We can see that they are highly distinguishable with one another. Next, we perform model selection with future data, which is 1,000 forecasted w first mock realizations based on lambda CDM fiducial model. Note that the official name of w first has changed to Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. As shown on the figure and table on the slide, the likelihood distribution for the three different models and their estimated type two successes, which indicate the numbers of cases that the wrong models are ruled out beyond 95% or 99% confidence limit are highly distinguishable from one another. Now, here are summarized that we find no model dependence nor redshift evolution of Likert hyperparameters and find that reconstructed expansion history and dark energy properties are consistent with prediction of lambda CDM, allowing some additional flexibility. We also find that about four to five percent of Pantheon-like simulations have similar oscillatory features with that in the Pantheon data, which might indicate systematics or new physics. Finally, we show that model selection and parameter estimation using the iterative smoothing method works well, which confront with Bayesian analysis. Our next paper in preparation is about um, confronting model selection based on conventional Bayesian analysis using Bayesian evidence with that based on frequentist analysis using the iterative smoothing method. Two plots on the slide from our next paper in preparation show example that the true model is not lambda CDM 
nor PEDE, but patient evidence distribution supports Andacidium, while likely distributions exclude both models at a high rate. Please check the paper that will be uploaded on archive as soon as possible. Thank you for listening to our talk. Questions and comments are always welcome. And for more detail, please see the papers on the slide. Okay, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Are there any questions? Okay, if not, yes, I have a question. Sorry. Sure. Uh, sorry. Do you use only pendulum data for analysis or you use something other catalogs, supernova catalogs? Uh, I'm sorry, but if you don't mind, please, please, please tell me the question again. Um, sorry. Do you use only Pantheon data for analysis? Which uh, supernova catalog do you analysis? Only Pantheon ah. or something else? Okay, in the beginning of the uh, try, uh, in the beginning of the uh, uh, trying to trying to use uh, direct model testing, we use Pantheon data to check the model dependence of the. Uh, of the likely distribution, uh, which which is based on the fiducial model, but next to that we use the uh, forecasted future W first data. So that is kind of uh, how should I say? Yeah, mock data of uh, W uh, mock data generated based on certain fiducial model using uh, W uh, forecasted W first covariance metrics. So I can say that mm -hmm. we didn't, we oh, didn't, we use not only Pantheon, but also many other data. Yeah. Okay, thank you for information. You're welcome. Okay, I have one question. Sure. Yeah, what's the motivation behind the kink model? Actually, I'm confused about this kink model. I'm not familiar with this stuff. Ah, so fine. Uh, Interpret it in a very really deep way. Okay, we we chose the kick model to uh, uh, as a, just as an example. We didn't have specific reason to choose uh, specific, uh, specific reason to choose kink model, but yeah, uh, uh, we could find uh, we we could use those uh, lambda CD and pattern kink model to show uh, how this uh, the direct model uh, model uh, model testing work, uh, using the iterative smoothing mo mo method works well. Yeah, okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much again for your talk. You're welcome. And our next speaker will be Arkana Sangwan. Please share your screen, thank you. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. So please go ahead. The talk will be on constraining the dark energy dark matter interaction using low redshift observations. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. so uh, uh, I would like, like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity. Uh, Arkana, uh, we, we don't hear you very well. Uh, now? Yeah, it's better. Okay, okay. Uh, all right. So. Okay, so uh, very briefly, I will give a little bit of uh, information about the background. Cosmological observations suggest that nearly 75% of the energy budget of the universe is dominated by dark energy. However, the nature of dark energy is still a mystery. And the simplest model, uh, simplest description to dark energy is given in the lambda CDM model where dark energy is described by cosmological constant in which the equation of state is, a const is constant throughout the evolution history of the universe. The Planck mission, which observes the CMB and isotropy and studies the physics of the early universe to constrain the cosmological uh, parameters by assuming a flat lambda CDM model, supports the standard lambda CDM cosmological model very strongly. However, in the past decade, we noticed 
potential tensions arise in estimates reported by Planck and some of the low redshift known Planck uh, probes. The most controversial tension is the discrepancy in the estimation of Hubble constant, which represents the expansion rate of the universe at present. Uh, the Planck observation by assuming a base lambda CDM model reports at zero to be around 67.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec, uh, which is a considerably lower value when we compare it with the uh, estimates reported by direct, lo uh, direct local distance uh, ladder measurement, such as uh, from Shoes collaboration, which reports at zero to be around 74.03 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now, uh, this discrepancy, uh, this show, uh, value shows a discrepancy at a level uh, which is greater than four sigma, and this is known as the long-standing S zero tension in cosmology. So, uh, uh, this agreement, as well as uh, other disagreements in the parameter estimates from Lam uh, from Planck, as well as other uh, low redshift observation, suggest that. Uh, a new uh, points towards a new physics that deviates from the standard lambda CDM model. Uh, many models has been in introduced in the literature which deviates from the uh, lambda CDM model. Here I'm going to discuss only, uh, I'm going to discuss a dark, ener uh, dark energy dark matter interaction model, which is, uh, which is reported in the paper by uh, some of my collaborators, Jos uh, uh, Dr. Joseph, uh, Johnson, as well as Professor, uh, Professor Shankar Narayanan. So, uh, as we have very little information about the nature of dark energy, there is no unique way to describe the dark energy, dark matter interaction. Hence, in many of the models, the interaction term is introduced by hand. But in this particular paper, the authors uh, demand that the interaction strength, uh, Q, in the dark sector must have a field theory description and then they obtain a unique form of interaction strength. Uh, they show that a one, uh, that a one to one mapping between the field theory description and the fluid description of interacting dark sector dark matter exists only for this unique form of potential uh, uh, interaction uh, term that they have shown in the paper. So uh, I will, um, um, one of my collaborator has already talked about this model in detail in one of the parallel sessions yesterday. So I will very briefly touch upon the model. The action for dark energy dark matter interaction model is given in equation one. Here, the scalar field is uh, described by the phi, and the dark matter scalar field is described by chi. The variation of action with respect to metric gives us the Einstein equation, which in fluid description is given in equation two, uh, where the energy momentum tens tensor for dark matter scalar field is given in equation three. Now, uh, the total uh, stress energy tensor is conserved, but note the individual components, which gives us a form of interaction, uh, which is in first equation. Uh, it uh, gives us the form of interaction in terms of the derivative of energy momentum tensor, energy momentum tensor of dark matter. Now, depend, uh, now if we demand that the uh, interaction term have, uh, must have a field theory uh, description, then it gives us a unique uh, interaction term, which is given in equation four. Now, uh, we consider, uh, now we consider a model where dark energy is described by a Quinson scalar field in which the potential is given by the inverse power potential or the uh, pebbles Sweta potential and the coupling parameter alpha is linear in phi. We then consider this model and try to study the consistency of this model with low red, redshift observations. Here C is the interaction strength that we consider in the analysis. Now, first we study the uh, background evolution and uh, try to see how it, uh, how it do with the observation. So uh, the evolution of universe is given by Friedman equation, which depends upon the energy density and the pressure of the individual components of the universe. And the dynamics of universe is given by klein gordon equation, which is given in equation five. The, if we consider a scalar, uh, if we write the scalar field potential in dimensionless parameter phi, then the uh, uh, scalar field potential will take the form as given in equation six. Now the evolution of non latistic matter density will depend upon the interaction term Q, which is given here. And for a, for a specific interaction term that was introduced in the paper, in the paper that I mentioned earlier, which has a uh, field uh, theory description as well, uh, is given in equation seven. For this particular potential, the energy density for a non-relativistic matter density scales um, 
as this so uh, now very briefly i'll discuss the observation and techniques that we have used uh, for uh, to study the consistency of the model with the observation we use four types of low redshift observation the direct measurements of hubble uh, parameter denoted by h of z bayon acoustic oscillation measurements that are denoted by bao the high redshift h2 galaxy measurements uh, denoted by h2g and taipani supernovae observation the observation uh, the uh, redshift for each of the uh, redshift range for each of the observation is mentioned here for the analysis we use chi square minimization technique so generally a data set has i points of observa observable at a particular redshift uh, uh, along with the error associated with the observable so uh, we uh, by assuming a particular or specific model which in this case is the uh, interacting dark sector model we calculate the same observable theoretically and then compare these two chi squares measure the goodness of the fit that is by how much the observable value differs uh, from the theoretically expected one <clears throat> so using these observation we try to uh, find the constraints on the model parameter the model in this case is described by four parameters h0 the present value of hubble parameter omega m the non relativistic matter density parameter at present w0 equation of state of dark energy at present and the coupling uh, coupling strength or interaction strength c so the priors used in the analysis is uh, listed here Uh, now we show the one sigma two sigma three sigma confidence region for various cosmological parameters used in this model here the uh, first in the first row i show the constraints obtained from uh, the h, uh, from the analysis of h of z uh, observation uh, we see that uh, h of z, uh, h of z data allows a very large range for omega m as well as h0 the best fit value for h0 in this case is 69.34 kilometers per second per megaparsec but the h0 data within 3 sigma uh, allows a large range such that uh, the planck uh, uh, estimates as well as the local measurement estimates also are uh, also lie within this particular range that means h0 is consistent with both of them Uh, we also found that we also uh, we also can see that uh, the h0 uh, observation does not constrain the cosmological uh, the uh, coupling constant c uh, and uh, we uh, and in this case we find that it instead of uh, uh, here we have marginalized over other parameters such that uh, w0 and when we are showing the plots in two dimensional plane we have marginalized over the rest of the parameters so if we instead of marginalizing marginalizing over w0 if we fix w0 at a particular value and then uh, um, move away from uh, the lambda cdm like scenarios we start to get a uh, limit upper limit and lower limit on uh, coupling strength c uh, the results on the second row is obtained from the analysis of bao plus h of z data we see that bao data provides a very narrow range for omega m and h0 the best fit value for b uh, by this uh, bao and h of z is 70.6 uh, km per second per megaparsec and omega the best fit value for omega m is 0.3 we find uh, we can see that the data manages to uh, constrain the coupling constant within one sigma region we get the upper limit as well as lower limit for the coupling constant which is excuse me which is minus 0.87 to uh, minus 0.29 and within 3 sigma region we get a upper limit of on c which is 0.01 after that uh, in the first uh, row uh, the constraints are obtained from h2g data we see that h2g data does not constrain uh, provides a very large range for omega m it allows the in, almost the entire range that is considered in the analysis for omega m and uh, also it allows fairly large range for h0 however the best fit value for h2g obtained is 71.3 km and within one sigma region h2g observations uh, is not are not consistent with the planck observations we also see that the h2g data does not constrain the coupling constant at all and uh, yeah but also in the similar uh, two previous cases we uh, 
see that instead of marginalizing over W0, if we fix W0 at a specific value and then start moving away from uh, lambda stadium like scenarios, we then again start getting a limit on the coupling constant. The uh, plots in the on the bottom are uh, obtained from S uh, from the analysis of SN plus HZ data. Uh, we again see that uh, supernovae data provides a very narrow constraints on omega m and h0. The best fit value for h0 is 69.5 kilometer per second per megaparsec, and uh, for omega m it is 0 0.31. We uh, see that although not in three sigma region, uh, the data manages to constrain coupling constant within one sigma region. Within one sigma region, the upper limit is given to be 0 0.05. So here we are showing the result of the combined constraint, uh, the com combination of the uh, all the data sets. We see that uh, the uh, the best fit value. We find that the best fit value for H0 is 69.9 kilometers. Omega m is 0. For omega m, it is 0 0.29 kilometers. We uh, we can see that the H0 the range for H0 in this case is very narrow within one sigma as well as within three sigma. And by combination of the uh, by uh, com combined data set, we managed to get upper limit as well as lower limit on the uh, interaction strength. We also uh, we also find that um, we also can see that BOA data out of all the observation has the most constraining cap capacity as uh, that is why the uh, combined constraints are basically Maximum, maximum influence maximum by the BA, BAO observation. After that, we see uh, what are the constraints in W0 and omega m plane. We can uh, the first one uh, on the uh, left, top left, is uh, for H of Z data. The top right is from BAO plus H of Z. The bottom left is from H 2 G data, and the bottom right is from H, uh, supernovae plus HZ data. So we can see that uh, the HZ data are, um, allows the maximum range for W0, uh, the e equation of state of dark energy. It also allows for uh, non accelerating uh, universe. And uh, yeah, it also allows for non accelerating universe and is consistent with the lambda CDA model. Next is the BAO uh, observation. From BAO, we see that BAO observations are not consistent with the lambda CDM model within one sigma region, although they are consistent within three sigma region, and they provide the narrowest constraints on W0. Then the uh, H2G data, we see that does not constrain omega m at all. It allows the entire range within uh, that we have considered in the analysis, but provides a very uh, narrow range on, on on uh, W0 that is of minus 0 0.9. Supernovae data also allows, uh, also uh, provides a relatively larger range as compared to BAO, but uh, constrained W0 within minus 0 0.9. So all of these data uh, sets are consistent with lambda CDM model within three sigma region. So now we uh, study how if uh, the potential varies from Phi to the power minus one to phi to the power minus two, how the uh, constraints changes. So here I'm presenting only the combined constraints. Uh, uh, we see that uh, the constraints on H0 and omega m do not change significantly. Same pattern is also observed in individual data sets that, uh, that there is a very slight shift in the contours. The constraints on coupling constant, however, changes significantly when we change uh, the value of n, that is the power, phi to the power minus one, as you go from phi to the power minus one to phi to the power minus two, the contour shifts towards la um, more neg uh, negative values of C. And we find that for uh, phi to the power minus two potential, C equal to one is not consistent with the observation. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll summarize the results very briefly that uh, all the observations considered here constraints H0 to be very close to 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. The constraints obtained on omega m from various observations uh, are consistent with each other as well as uh, from previous studies. So, and uh, 
except for xz data all the datas uh, somehow prefers a negative value of c i haven't shown here but we can uh, we have analyzed that instead of marginalizing over w0 if we fix w0 at a at a specific value and then move away from w equal to minus 1 case we start getting uh, upper limit on the interaction strength c uh, okay and from these observation we it is very clear that using only the background observation we cannot distinguish between non interacting and interacting dark sector scenarios therefore we then move to evolution of perturbation now to potentially detect the difference between interacting and non interacting sector we look at the evolution of three perturbed quantities which are relevant to three different cosmological observation first one is the evolution of delta m which basically affects the uh, which basically the effect of which can be uh, studied in the large scale structure observation now here uh, delta m is the matter density perturbation here q uh, uh, small q is the uh, capital q which is normalized and uh, delta delta m is the difference in, in the interacting and non interacting uh, matter density perturbation so on, on the left side we show the evolution of q as a function of a number of e folding for various length scales specify uh, uh, for various length scales for various values of initial value of omega matter so here we have uh, we have also studied the change of various length scales but we have found that the interaction uh, strength is or the coupling term is basically more sensitive uh, to the smaller scales or larger value of k by h not so uh, we see that a uh, larger is the value of uh, initial value of omega matter uh, earlier the value of q in uh, the value of q increases at an earlier time and stays at a higher value till a value of n equal to almost equal to 0.2 which corresponds to a redshift of around 5 uh, uh, this trend is then uh, reflected in the evolution of delta m which we can see on the uh, plot on the right so uh, the uh, there are uh, green blue and red curves correspond to different value of initial value of omega matter and there are solid lines as well as the dotted lines solid lines represent when we are considering the entire uh, model that is uh, interaction as well as the perturbation in the interaction term but for the dotted lines we are considering only the background interaction term and ignoring the uh, uh, in, uh, perturbation in the interaction uh, we uh, can see that uh, we can see that the larger is the value of omega m more suppressed is the evolution of delta m yeah and this uh, effect is more prominent at larger values of uh, larger values of k if, which we have shown here and the by uh, this basically provides us a way to detect the signature of dark sector interaction model by uh, by stud by studying the uh, uh, large scale structure observation now we move on to the evolution of uh, phi uh, which basically describes the which basically uh, describes the weak lensing so here again we see the evolution of phi uh, from a larger redshift of around 1500 to 0 uh, we see that uh, uh, for different length scales we see that uh, at around uh, n equal to minus 3 the uh, for all the uh, interaction strength the left plot is for uh, interaction Uh, model and the right um, plot is for non interacting model we can see that up to a value of n equal to minus 3 the model is similar we cannot differentiate between these two but after that we can see the deviation in the evolution of phi which we can uh, which we can uh, detect in the uh, uh, in the observation of weak lensing Uh, next we see the ev evolution of phi prime as a function of n and this term contributes to uh, in the integrated zexus effect 
uh, here again we see the similar uh, trend that at uh, smaller values of uh, n there is no much deviation between interacting and non interacting scenario but as uh, the value uh, of n approaches minus 3 the curve starts deviating especially for the uh, smaller scales that is higher value of k by h not and uh, we can uh, through the observation of cmb or integrated zaxorf effect in cmb we can detect the we can differentiate between the interacting and uh, non interacting scenarios so now i will con conclude the talk that um, all the four data sets constrain the value of s0 which is close to 70 km per second per mega parsec the observations are consistent the constraints from observations are consistent with each other and the tightest constraints are obtained by bao plus h of z observation and except for z measurement all the data sets show a preference for negative value of interaction strength the interacting dark sector model is consistent with low redshift ob observations and by studying the density perturbation uh, delta m phi and phi prime we can basically uh, differentiate between interacting and non interacting scenario thank you okay thank you very much arkana for this nice talk are there any questions uh can i talk or after yes yes of course okay so thank you for the talk uh i have some questions about uh uh the way you distinguish between dark matter and dark energy because the lagrangian they are both you know the way it looks they both look like two scalar fields which are coupled together which is, which is what you call interaction but uh, how do you make the distinction between what you call dark matter and dark energy and then uh another question uh is um, uh when you compute the perturbation you use the newton gauge uh yeah. if you if If you had used the the moving gauge, but I know that in the context of dark energy, the it's more common to use the Newton the the Newton gauge. But anyway, in, in the context of uh, of moving gauge, you would have some entropy. You would expect to have some entropy. And what is the equivalent of this entropy, or what what people call as let's say entropy in the moving gauge in the context of of the Newton gauge that you're using? And then one last question is uh, when you write down the equation of motions, uh, are you imposing that each fluid is satisfying the conservation law, or just uh, the full, uh, let's say, no, no, the uh, the uh, energy momentum tensor, which include both matter and their energy together? Because in principle, you could impose an additional constraint and impose that the energy and dark matter satisfy in separately the um, energy conservation, or you may just say that. I study question they just you know impose the conservation of the full um, sum of the two we are actually uh, imposing only one uh, the total energy momentum tensor is conserved not the individual one okay we are not imposing any other constraint on the on this model parameter okay i see yeah and uh, about uh, i i am i'm really sorry i kind of forgot the earlier question Uh, first one i guess is uh, so so how do you distinguish between dark matter so this is basically okay so this is basically uh, action in this you can uh, describe one by uh, one by either field so here we are dis uh, describing phi uh, phi taking phi as a description for the scalar field and xi as a description for uh, no, uh, dark matter scalar field uh, i mean you can i am actually not very clear about your question if it is yeah i cannot hear you i i cannot yeah well yeah, you, you know I, so I so can't... i couldn't hear you but i I would suggest that you yeah. continue by chat, right? Yeah, is sure. Possible? Yeah, that is fine by me. Okay, so thank you again. Okay. Thanks to all speakers okay. of this morning session for very for having delivered very interesting talks. And this session will resume on Thursday afternoon. Okay, thank you to everybody.
thanks to all speakers to and to, and to all participants. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, see you on our next uh, next session. Okay. See you. See bye you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Apa nak? Hmm.